Hello everybody and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where, it goes, where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order. We share our analysis and research findings. And today is a very special day because soon this will not be the intro anymore. Because this is the very last Studio Ghibli, Ghibli movie at time of release of this podcast. Another one is in the works, but we will have to come up with a new intro soon. And for the last time to celebrate the intro, I even butchered it a little bit. But don't worry, it's not that bad. You all know it by now. That just We're makes here it to extra talk. special. Yes, that's my <laughs> anniversary uh, uh, gift. Uh, anniversary. My celebration or my requiem for this intro. Anyways, we're talking about a movie released in the year 2020. We're now entering uh, the current decade for... You know what? I just realized the Nausicaa started in 2019, right? Damn. Damn, we're old. Anyways, um... Well, what were you talking about? 2019? That was like, what was that? A couple of years ago? It felt, Wait, that, was, like that was last year. <laughs> and it feels like a different world entirely, because we've had a lot of things happening in the world in between then and now. Things that, in some small way, also factor into the discourse about this movie, but not in a very significant way. But we'll get to it. Which movie? Well, the 2020 movie uh, directed by Goro Miyazaki called Earwake and the Witch, or uh, Aya Tomajo. Is that right? I keep, I keep hearing tomato when, when uh, yeah. <laughs> I have to keep reading it as well when I see the the Japanese title. It's like t- <laughs> tomato. But yeah, that, that's correct. Interesting thing about the translation too here, because uh, I had such a strange disconnect when reading the subtitles and hearing the Japanese voices who were calling her Aya, but the subtitles insisted on Erika. Leaving that aside for now, it is an interesting movie for Studio Ghibli for a very obvious reason, and that's basically the elephant in the room we're going to address right here ahead of time. It's the first fully 3D CG animated film directed by Studio Ghibli stuff. And we have thoughts on that. Uh, Maybe some surprising thoughts, maybe just also the same thoughts that a lot of other people have. We'll get into that as well. But first, a few details about the movie. It's a movie adapted from a book by Diana Wynne-Jones, who unfortunately died right around the time the book was sort of published. It was published posthumously based on manuscripts and notes. And, you know, it was basically a work in progress book. It wasn't really finished. Um, And picking up this unfinished work of Diana Wynne-Jones, who also, uh, Diana Wynne-Jones, who had also written the book for Howl's Moving Castle previously, or rather, it sounds weird to say she wrote the book for, she wrote the book that was adapted into Howl's Moving Castle before. This is, uh, makes it an interesting recurrence and maybe kind of a send-off for her uh, as well. Uh, We might debate whether or not that is a good send-off, but hey, let's leave that aside. Um, I want to introduce you to my fellow podcast hosts today, and we're going to be starting with Platon Skull. Hello, uh, that's me. Uh, I'm here to to, uh, complain about uh, how uh, there's not enough rock and roll. That's the main thing, I think. Mr. Skull, what's your problem? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He, him, I do think you called me Mr. to begin with, so I think that, that cleared it up. Uh, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Um, next up is Hipster Cthulhu. That's me. Uh, he, him, as always. Also, I will say this movie has a funny significance to me because it does reference Boy Scouts cooking in Epping Forest, a place I've literally been to as a Boy Scout uh, and camped at. So, uh, a nice connection there. I'm and probably the most positive thing about this whole movie, the, the detail to recreating England in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways this movie really nails, so I'll, I'll give it major points on that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the uh, English anecdotes. And we also have Ziff. Hello, I'm Ziff, and luckily I do not have any English or Britain propaganda uh, to offer you, so I, I hope that's good news. Uh, and my pronouns are they, them. And, of course, there's always me, your host, Nyard, he, him. So, let's get right into this. Um, The movie was originally a straight-to-TV adaptation, but it did premiere at film festivals. It had a theatrical release later on, and this puts it into the 
kind of small category of Ghibli films, uh, where which is only inhabited by Yewick and the Witch and Ocean Waves, uh, which is the TV movies. Um, it shows, I think. Uh, it's definitely less bombastic, less grandiose, less epic than you would expect for a theatrical release. And, you know, this puts it right along Ocean Waves, which also was a uh, pretty subdued and I feel like low stakes film or a low key film. Maybe that's the better way of phrasing it. Yeah, I would say so too. Like, um, when I when I watched this film and I thought back about all the all the other films I've seen of Ghibli, I would say it's most like Ocean Waves or My Neighbor the Yamadas, which is not a TV film, but could very well be. Where it's yeah, it's just kind of a fun little romp but not really anything grandiose like you most people would probably expect from from a Ghibli film. Yeah, my Nabi the Diamondus felt like a TV show. They just had like clipped into being a movie. Uh, <laughs> and this 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 movie I feel like we'll talk about it a bit more when we get into like the structure of it, but it's it's so close to the book that it's based on that like it feels so low key because essentially like is a children's book I, that I that I did read and it's only like a like hundred pages and is literally you know designed to be told over I guess two to three bedtimes like that's the exact stakes of the story and the exact kind of like pacing it has so this movie kind of has a very weird thing where you feel like is, is it going to start or like is it already over uh, <laughs> yeah very it, kind of odd nature to it that yeah like because it, it's not like a typical Ghibli script where it's kind of made from the ground up or even like how's moving castle from another diane Wynne jones work that's like was like very much reworked like miyazaki put in a lot of stuff uh on top of the already existing material yeah and uh, as uh, as you point out Nyad, uh the original story was uh published po- posthumously it was essentially like a work in progress uh, kind of unfinished uh, some gaps left to be filled in and uh it really explains a lot about this movie i think uh, especially uh with as you point out hipster how 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 little it uh, it changes from the original uh and it's which which it's kind of disappointing because if 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 you get the chance to like adapt an already like unfinished work with a lot of gaps in it then like that isn't that an opportunity to like really get creative with it and uh, and you know fill in some of those gaps and uh, and do something uh, you know a bit extra i don't know uh i guess uh, they they probably had some uh, serious conversations about it uh, suzuki and uh, miyasaki junior well sort of not really uh, i guess this leads us into how the project was conceived right um which is what we always kind of talk about and as per usual the project originated from miyazaki and suzuki sitting down and this is miyazaki's senior so hayao miyazaki um and just talking about the book at one point in time it happened that uh hayao miyazaki and suzuki were talking okay miyazaki's senior said i am interested in two projects i'm interested in how do you live which we're already working on and also in adapting yowick and the witch Suzuki, can you help me decide which one should I go with? And Suzuki said, you're going to do How Do You Live? And we're going to hand Yawik and the Witch to Goro. Goro, who at this point had already read the book, was approached by Suzuki and said, you know what? I did read it. I was thinking about adapting this into film. Glad you're proposing this. But I'm doing my own thing, basically. And... Goro himself kind of accounts for that, saying, you know, initially Suzuki came to me with the project, but kind of afterwards I did my own thing. That he was, Goro was for the first time ever, I guess, uh, completely on his own with young staffers and lots of freelance workers working on this movie. He himself as the lead, as the creative lead, with not much correspondence with the old guard. So really when we talk about what this movie does and doesn't do, we're going to put it on Goro and his team, including, by the way, some recurring Ghibli stuff like uh, Keiko Niwa and Emi Gunji on screenplay. So definitely some of the talent is still there, but almost the entirety of the animation stuff, except for like very few like character design and so on, uh, 
were old Ghibli God, but everything else was young staffers and, you know, freelancers expertise uh, in, with expertise in 3D CG. So a very different project from what we're usually tackling with Ghibli, which is usually really familiar in-house productions with staff that knows each other for forever, with strong oversight by Miyazaki and Suzuki. None of that here. Completely Goro. All right. Now we know who to blame. <laughs> Uh, our poor boy Goro, he's, he's received his fair share of blame by everyone for all of his movies so far, so, you know. <laughs> oh, I think he received some credit for uh, Poppy Hill. Yeah, from me. <laughs> no, for, from some people as well. I think From Up on Poppy Hill is definitely Goro's uh, least critically panned movie. Uh, yeah, I, was, I wasn't on the cast, but uh, I, I did like uh, From Up on Poppy Hill quite a bit, and I did think... Uh... It was nice to see Goro make a movie that felt far more complete and thorough, even if it wasn't the best. Uh, it did feel like, you know, like, a, as Miyazaki said, it's an earnest work. Like, uh, it really does what it needed to. All right. Well, uh, so this is, uh, as mentioned before, Big Elephant in the Room, first 3D CGI uh, production from a uh, Studio Ghibli. Uh, hence, like, that's a big part of the reason why it's like a... a lot of like new people it's not the same uh general team that uh that you uh, normally know from a uh, studio ghibli and uh and uh goro uh cut his teeth on uh, some uh, 3d cgi animation with uh the uh tv adaptation of uh, uh ronya the robber's daughter uh a story by Ast Astrid Lindgren that got adapted into i think it's an Am amazon prime production and uh, has this uh, cell shaded 3D thing with 2D elements. Um, by by all accounts, uh, horrendously bad looking. Um, but you know, you you, you got to start somewhere. And so uh, you know, with with that, with a bit of experience under his belt, Goro could like take more charge of a um, of a movie production. Well, a TV movie production. And I mean, we definitely have to note, uh, even though this is the other pretty much fully CG work by Studio Ghibli, uh, and we, as you've mentioned, it looks, you know, it looks pretty bad. Uh, I, I don't like being very negative about things, but here I just don't have kind words for it. It just doesn't look very good. With Eric and the Witch, they actually decided to take a different visual route. So uh, basically, Goro, in deciding how the look of the movie would be, basically said that a lot of the CG that is used in Japan in the anime industry is really focused on mimicking the look of 2D artwork. And that is true for Ronya as well, for the show. So for Eowick and the Witch, he did want to take a little bit of a different route. He did want to still retain some of the familiar Ghibli aesthetic in terms of character designs. And you can see that when you look at, well, I'm going to call her by a Japanese name, Aya. Uh, when you look at her, she definitely has the character design of a Ghibli girl. And I mean, it is the old uh, Ghibli character designer back at work again, uh, Kondo-san, um, whose first name I forget right now. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but... Uh, the general design sense was to take more inspiration from other kinds of 3D CG animation, mostly from the West, which would include the works by Artvark, for example, Wallace and Gromit, but also uh, Leica Studio, who uh, I think uh, Platon can talk about uh, their uh, movie a little bit more because I haven't seen it, but you have, Platon. Yeah, uh, a quick correction. Uh, it's not a type of 3D CGI animation. It's stop motion, which is a different medium entirely. Um, so but, did Leica uh, actually do stop motion or is it CG yes, that looks Le like Leica, stop motion? Leica is uh, the studio behind uh, 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 Coraline, I believe, and uh, Paranorman, uh, Kubo and the Two Strings, uh, more recently a movie called Missing Link, uh, Box Trolls, uh, that's them as well. Uh, they're like the studio uh, keeping uh, stop motion animation alive, while uh, Aardvark, uh, who made uh, Wallace and Gromit and uh, Shaun the Sheep, they're, they're, they're still going strong as well. Isn't it Aardman? Aardman? But... Aardman, I'm pretty Wait, sure. Wait, who, who's Aardvark? Aardvark? I've Wait, am I forgetting Aardvark. something? Um, uh, I, said, I, said, I said Aardvark Studio. Uh, is that not correct? No, it's Aardman. Uh But it does, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I kind of see the, the point you're saying where, like, uh, Ewig does not like go for the anime 3D look. It goes for much more of a, you know, like I guess DreamWorks and Pixar are also very big in in 3D uh, animation stuff. 
Yeah, but, uh, and it's going for that, like, f- far more like... It's weird to describe, and that's where I think is kind of off-putting about the movie to some people, where it's like, they're kind of anime designs, but their skin is, like, more realistic, and everything about all the textures and the proportions of all the characters feel far more, like, realistic, and the way they're animated is more to emulate real life uh, than it is to, like, be, like, more of an exaggerated anime. Uh, but I will say, in, in the movie's favor, uh, it genuinely, I think it's pretty good for Japan, because if you look at a lot of Japanese 3D animated things, it's a lot of awful. Like, Lupin the First looks great, and, you know, there's few other examples that look anywhere mm. near as good as that. So I feel yeah. like for a t- first time, like, t- doing this as a big feature film, Goro did probably much better than a lot of other people in the industry at the time. So I will give him credit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd say that I I wouldn't say that it looks realistic. Um, like what 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 looked to me most like uh, when I was looking at the character, what like stood out to me more was how it looked a little bit like doll like or something like that. Yeah. It, it did kind of like remind me of the stop motion kind of aesthetic because a lot of the characters' skin they felt. It felt a little bit clay, like it was like clay or something, hmm. and it yep. was, and it it really did look like it was moving puppets, kind of, uh, yeah, more at, than at, realistic for me. At first, I noticed that sort of negatively. I was like, "Why is this like moving like puppets? Like a little bit uncanny, a little bit, a little bit wooden." And it was like uh, for me a very negative experience at first, but I kind of put it together later on. And I, I, when reading about how they designed and decided on how to animate this, it turns out, yeah, they did actually build puppets. Like, th- it wasn't animated by puppets, so it isn't like stop motion. It is CG, of course, but they did build puppets, and then they even had a puppet show in the Ghibli Museum to, you know, promote this uh, movie ahead of time. So there is a very conscious decision to have the characters be more puppet-like. And in hindsight, I think I can appreciate that de- design choice more. I think we we read many complaints about how the movie looks plasticky and fake and like weirdly glossy and wooden and doll-like. And I think to an extent, that is a purposeful decision. And looking at it like that, I think I can like it more than many people give it credit for. And I also put it in the same ballpark as Lupin the First, like Hipster mentioned, which I also think is a pretty good looking uh, attempt at making anime, but very, you know, plastic and CG. All right. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I, I disagree with you there um, because uh, so l- looking at the, um, like the, the interviews we, we have, uh, the, the background of, uh, of the design choices made, uh, a, a big deal is made about like the hair specifically is this, like where it starts. Uh, because you have have these character designs with like really voluminous uh, hair, and uh, and when you're doing um, like three D CGI animation, uh, you have a, have a choice. Do do you like uh, do a, a, like a big mesh of like individual strands of hair, uh, or or do you do more like a piecemeal like uh, uh, which uh, which is what they went for, and that's specifically like inspired by uh, he, he does quote directly like um, Goro Miyazaki. He talks about Kubo and the Two Strings as a as an inspiration and you can kind of uh and that's part of how the the doll like aesthetic comes about you look at uh at, at earwig's hair that uh, Aya's hair what, what you, whatever you want to call her and um it it looks like um like matte painted uh wood or, or like chocolates honestly like uh, and each individual like strand is like its own individual piece um which it's part of what makes it look uh, look like a doll look uh, look plastic ish um, and uh, and it is definitely an aesthetic choice. I think I, I just think it's like kind of the wrong choice for the for this medium because uh, it ends up looking cheap, uh, in my opinion. Like it looks like something that you could definitely get away with in, in like a uh, you know a TV a TV show or something. But like for a feature length film, it just I don't know, it, it falls sort of flat and it doesn't play to the strengths of a 3D animation. Um, uh, I, I get like taking inspiration from Kubo and the Two Strings, which is like a gorgeous movie, like the, probably still the most impressive uh, stop motion and anim- animation film ever made. But that movie is stop motion, and and stop motion has its own like strengths and, and weaknesses, and they played with that. Uh, and I think there's there's some incongruity here that uh, that is off putting to a lot of people, including myself. 
Yeah, I think I. It's good that we have at least one representation of like a lot of the critics of this film, right? Um, but I would say, like, for me subjectively, I didn't really work that well for me. Um, the main, the main reason why for me is that um, the facial expressions yes. just were a bit weird, and there wasn't that much variation in it. If you look at like older Ghibli films, and yes, I'm gonna do the crime of like comparing this to really great Ghibli films. And it's not a crime. Face- it wants to be compared. <laughs> it, it, it directly like uh, pays homage to well, uh, old stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure, but it's it's on a very different scale. But anyways, I'm I'm gonna go on a limb anyway. And if if you look at like those expressions, they're very telling. They're very. Uh, they're they're very uh, there's a big variety in the expressions and you can very clearly tell what what the character is feeling or thinking. Uh, for me in Earwig or with Aya, I felt like she was kind of either happy or frustrated or feeling schemish or uh, something like that. And there was one section where uh, I think it was in the uh, in the um, foster home, not foster home, but uh, orphan home thing, where she just looked for like, I think five minutes in a row, just looked very frustrated and angry. And it just felt very weird for me because she was just holding the exact same facial expression for a while. And it also felt kind of off to me how she looked in that moment. So I definitely think they lost something when it comes to facial expressions. But on the other hand, I do think the textures of all the all the different objects, like when you look at the coat of uh, of of the witch, for example, or on the hat, or all the other kind of objects, I think they really pulled it off well, and I think it really amplified kind of the physicality of the world really well. You can really kind of almost feel like what those objects would feel like, or what it would be like to crunch the leaves or like pick up some something that I would pick up uh, so for me it's kind of like a wash whether or not they really pulled it off but of course we still have to keep in mind that this is an offerages thing that uh, these things are very subjective right so whether something is off looking or not like apparently a lot of people think it's very off putting uh, or they don't like it um, but yeah, there's also people who do like it. So I don't know. It's kind of subjective. Um, I think I find myself kind of halfway between this. I feel like the animation has, uh, some really nice moments. Like you said, there's, there's a lot of like great tactile scenes where, uh, Earwig's pushing stuff around or whatever. And like, you really feel like the kind of reality of this world and like the way everything's animated. But then I remember there's one scene where she's like, She's like carrying multiple objects, and it's very clear those things are kind of like just floating as she's touching them in a, in an unrealistic way. Probably because it was hard to animate so many objects at once. But I generally feel this mostly comes down to kind of the character design, because I feel like um, uh, Bella Yaga and the Mandrake and Ewig's mother, their character designs are like fantastic, and they actually translate really well into the three D. But then Ewig's design feels like the classic Ghibli girl. But then that kind of gives her face this weird like lack of expression in 3D that they was really hard to pull off. So like, uh, what was it? Uh, Kondo who did the designs? Maybe they did them originally in 2D, and some of them just translated a bit worse to 3D. I feel like what the problem is, particularly Earwig's hair. Like you're right, Platon. You brought up how weird the hair is, particularly Earwig's little like hair horns. Reminds me of a of a of a classic panel from Astro Boy, in which Astro Boy talks directly to um. Tezuka himself, who's appearing in the comic, and asks, why does my hair always appear at this angle, no matter what way my head is turned? Uh, and Tezuka just goes, it's easier to draw that way. <laughs> and that's why Astro Boy's hair looks really weird in any 3D version, because it's these weird hair bits that don't make any sense in like a 3D space. So, same with Mickey Mouse, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, same, true. Uh, 
yeah, uh, I think that's exactly right. Like, I, I, I completely agree that uh, on the witches and Mandrake and so on, like, who have these, you know, really strongly exaggerated and freakish outlandish designs, I think the animation style looks really, really well in those cases. Like, Mandrake, for example, is just pleasant whenever he's on screen. Like, that's just really fun to see. Like, how, the way his face distorts, the way, like, fire appears in his glasses, and, like, everything about him is just adapted to this style. The fatal flaw is really, and I completely agree, to bring the Ghibli character design sense for Aya and for the other human, more human characters into this. And I had the same uncanny feeling. There was a moment when she and Custard both made these faces where they, like, went cross-eyed and like had it put a, put on a grimace and it looked weird looked fucking weird uh, it looks weird when Aya reacts to anything when her like pupils go tiny and like her eyebrows and she only has like three modes of eyebrows like these super furrowed mega arched eyebrows and like uh, uh, shocked eyebrows and like neutral which is also super furrowed and, and arched eyebrows so I definitely think that the decisions made and Goro is actually talking about the decisions that there was an intention to keep some of that Ghibli look. That is the fatal flaw of this movie's CG conception. Because if you had just decided to go out there, like with all the witches who look really cool, I think. I, I do think the witches look cool. I also the hair, like the blue haired witch, Bella Yaga, her hair is fucking fabulous. It's not like when Aya's hair is like, especially when Aya has her hair down when she's like ready to go to bed and you have like these weird worry strands, I can totally see why that's off-putting. And I think it fucking works with the witch. So I'm in the position where I really like the look of this movie, except for when they kind of shoehorn the Ghibli girl style into it. And that's where I stand. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's worth like just giving a, a quick like rundown of like, okay, this is a CGI movie. Uh, why? What, what? What? What's the point of that? Like the main, the the, the main like point, uh, at least for like a lot of animation studios, is uh, it's relatively like cheaper um, to make animation uh, with uh, with computers in that way uh, compared to to hand drawn. Now, anime is is a bit of an exception because there's like a whole industry that's made this like very efficient workflow out of um, like getting as much uh, like bang for your buck as possible in 2D animation. Um, the uh, like Western animation uh, went over to CG uh, a lot quicker. Uh, I think that's part of the reason. Uh, it, it, it's like the, um, the aesthetic preferences of, uh, of these various industries. Uh, but, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, I, I think what really is damning to me um, about uh, Earwig is that it feels like that was the reason was because it's cheaper uh, and it looks that way. Uh, it feels that way. There are some strengths to CGI. There are reasons to like choose CGI animation for, for a given work. Um, those include uh, lighting. It's very like uh, the, the amount of like creativity and freedom you have in like lighting a scene. It's notoriously difficult to simulate uh, light sources uh, doing 2D animation. Um, like uh, Akira was like f famously like in insane uh, how like well they pulled that off, for instance. Um, but but when you have this like 3D environment that, that you, you just have to build, uh, you, you can do a lot of interesting things there. Uh, another benefit is like texture, um, especially as the technology uh, has evolved since like the, uh, the 1990s. Um, just like the, get, getting this uh, sense of like the the, sur the textile surfaces um, of, uh, of of the characters, uh, of the clothes, of the environments, um, and uh, you you also obviously have like uh, your know, digital effects stuff. Um, like a, a lot of modern anime, even two D anime, make a lot of use of like CG effect work, which doesn't really like often doesn't composite very well onto the 2D. But when you're in a 3D environment, like a lot of these like special effects stuff uh, can really shine. Um, and lastly, there's the virtual camera that a lot of like live action film techniques are like much easier um, and more um, intuitive to make use of. So, so uh, uh, compared to uh, having to draw everything every time. Um, and all these, all, all these like strong points 
I feel get squandered in this movie. The lighting is like flat in most scenes. Uh, it, and there's a lot of like dark environments. I, I remember reading like they, they specifically talked about in uh, in an interview with a uh, Verge, I think how like the, the background in the, um, the potion workshop, which a lot of the movie takes place in uh, it, it's a dark environment and they need the characters to be visible. So they had to fidget with the lighting, but what ends up happening is that, yeah, they pop off out from the background, but they, they look like they, they stand out too much. They don't, fit in there it's just, it's just an asset plopped in and uh, you know lighting settings kept to the same um not a lot of like impressive effects uh in in this movie obviously like we don't expect it to be pixar like it's, it's they're, they're not like experts in this stuff but like aside from like a few creative uh flourishes with uh, with mandrake i i don't really find anything of it impressive and the direction just like mostly emulates uh you know 2d style uh too much for my taste that, that that's like my big like thesis of like why this doesn't work animation wise well uh gotta have to disagree disagree with quite a few points there um i mean i think for one uh the idea that it's cheaper to produce animation like this is questionable the argument that Goro himself gave was not that it's cheaper, but that it's easier to have different animators work on the same character this way, because you don't need to have the one specialized key animator who really studied intricately this one character to make this character move, but rather you use characters more like dolls, because you have the character model created in CG and different animators can work on it. I mean, I guess it does kind of show that there is a limitation there, and the limitation is that the kind of extremely alive feeling animation of the characters that we're familiar with are not really here. I mean, characters do have unique sort of movements, but as we already mentioned, uh, it, it is a li little bit doll-like. But at the very least, we cannot say it's a cost-saving measure, because this movie was four years in production. Like, this took a long time to make, even the way it does look. So it's not like... I don't think it's fair to say it's just like a cost-saving or like a, a you know, effort-cutting measure. And then secondly... There's a huge advantage to using CG that Goro extensively talked about that you uh, did not mention. And the one, uh, this thing is that this movie takes place in one locale, in one house. Most of this movie takes place in this witch's house. And there's a few rooms in there. And Goro talked about how he wanted these extremely complex and ornate backgrounds with lots of clutter and items and textures and things here and there. But he didn't want... Uh, animators or background artists to continuously have to redraw the same room from different perspectives with this much clutter because he said it would be inevitable that there would be continuity errors or like oversights or that the workload would get tr tremendously huge. So th having these backgrounds in this and this is the smart choice that I, th I think having knowing that this film is set in a few selected locations he really uh, put the emphasis on let's realize these locations fully in CG and then, you know, let it happen like a stage play in this in these locations that we mapped out. I think that is actually a smart way of using CG. And lastly, I think the direction is using the advantages of CG because there's a lot more free camera movement. There's a there's like Hitchcock pulls in there. Like when when you first enter the uh, witch's kitchen, there's like a Hitchcock pull in there that makes you focus on how much clutter there even is as the characters fade into the background. And I don't think the characters are standing out that much. I think they talked in the interview about how difficult photography and lighting was but not in the way that they didn't do it, but that they, I think, talked about how hard it was to get it right, but I think they got it right. Like, I don't feel like the characters stand out too much from the background, and I don't think the lighting looks flat. I think everything look, looks pretty pleasant all around. I mean, I'm not really seeing that, so I gotta disagree there. <laughs> uh, Yeah, like uh, like I said, I, I feel like the movie works in, in a lot of places, but then, like, it becomes glaringly, like, kind of off-putting and in some parts so to, to me it's kind of 50 50 it's a bit all over the place but in general you're right i feel like the the movie does a good job of like realizing this house as a space uh and having all this clutter and all these the characters moving back and forth i could definitely see this movie being made as a stage play that 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 certainly adds up from goro's perspective and maybe i'm just getting a bit like you know psycho analysis uh here but you know i wonder what part of this is like almost goro trying to like make it out on his own because remember, there was one specific quote uh, about the making of this movie in which Goro said, like, I'm the only one at the studio who can do this. Like, I'm the only one with the training. And he kind of says, 
I did this movie by myself with basically, you know, a bunch of younger staff, like you said. Um, so I wonder what part of this movie is almost like, you know, Goro just trying to, I feel, you know, make it out on his own and prove, because we saw he did Poppy Hill, which was a very classically Ghibli-style kind of movie. Miyazaki even wrote the script for that. So, but this was far more Goro's own project, uh, particularly with the adaptation as well, because uh, part of me wonders if this adap- why this adaptation is so very accurate to the book to almost a fault uh, as a response to kind of how Earthsea was a very muddled, weird script trying to amalgam four books into one with not much coherency there. Uh, but I don't know, maybe I'm assuming too much about Goro personally. Yeah, well, in, in terms of like, if if this if the style doesn't put you off, if you think it looks like decent or, or good, like I, I I can't argue with that. Like that's just that that's when it gets really subjective. It's it's just like my my own reasoning. Um, in in terms of um, I, I, I agree with you, Hips, that there's there's a there's there's a clear like motivation to like do something new, do something different, uh, and I, re- I I definitely respect that. Um, it's just I don't think that the result is uh, is very uh, successful in, in many departments. Um, the 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 thing that like kind of gets to to me is um, like you 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 talked about yeah that like uh, well it's it's not necessarily just because it's cheap uh, it's it's also because like uh, th- this decision making about like limited locations and all that. Uh, I think there's a fine line between like choosing a te- specific technique because it's cheaper and choosing it because it's easier. Um, because like making the workflow easier is a good reason to like uh, to, to do something. But I don't know when, when you when you have the legacy of Studio Fucking Ghibli on your side, you know, like and- <laughs> we, we, we just, they did like they they didn't balk at like. Oh, that sounds like it's gonna be hard to animate. You know, they hunkered down, um, and I, th- I, th- I think I think that's like what, what's what's missing a, a bit is is this sense that uh, that it was like made with like some some like uh, artistic joy and not with like the, the, just this practical sense of like uh, like this is the easiest slash cheapest slash like most streamlined way to do it, and uh, and I, th- I think it carries through in in the uh, in the film itself, which I, again, I, th- I think it's just like th- this team with a lack of experience in 3D animation. Uh, like, there's clearly some some like talent behind like some of the character animation is like like uh, above average, definitely even for like um, you know a TV production CG animation. But I, I don't know. I, I, I think it, it's they're just they're at least a few movies away from like this really like working and not looking cheap. So at the very least, I want to comment on the one thing where you kind of talk about how you bring your Ghibli expectations in this and say, you know, we love Studio Ghibli because they're insane, basically. Like, we know that Miyazaki is a fucking madman for sticking with cell animation this late in his career, right? Like, manually hand-checking all the frames, like, having an insanely obsessive style to getting animation just right. And, I mean, it's exactly correct that this is not present here in this movie, but, like, Miyazaki Sr. himself said it about the movie of uh, his son made, right? Uh, and I'm quoting, It really doesn't matter that he's my son, does it? It being CG, not drawn with pencils, set him free. And what I'm reading into this is kind of like, for his entire career, Goro has been kind of struggling being the son of Hayao Miyazaki, right? Like, so there's expectations. Hayao Miyazaki is a legend. The movies that Goro, uh, you know, tackled like Tales from SC was trying to be a Mononoke Hima like epic and it didn't really live up to that and from up on Poppy Hill is more of a low-key sentimental piece but it felt very Miyazaki senior and Miyazaki senior was very involved in the production I think I like the idea that Goro was set free by CG because it is so radically departing from Hayao Miyazaki that Goro could sort of approach a movie not thinking about standing in the shadow of his dad even though and I think this is a little bit unfortunate the critical response to this movie of course was overwhelmingly dominated by oh this is not my Ghibli we feel kind of betrayed and you know what I think that is how it would have to happen right like this this is how it would end 
how it would always end and no way of you know Miyazaki senior saying Goro was set free would have changed that this movie will be evaluated from the lens of being a Ghibli movie and you know what it, as, a, as a Ghibli movie it doesn't really live up to the expectation of Ghibli and it is strikingly different even in, in the approach to how it was adapted right like Ghibli movies are usually like lush and original and weird twists on the original stories this isn't so much there's some additions and we'll talk about adaptation a little bit later but I think it is trying to be a much more humble thing because perhaps even Goro knows he is a little bit more of a humble director than Miyazaki senior is and I can respect that honestly I I, I absolutely get that point that we, we should we obviously shouldn't just let like uh the like name name of studio ghibli like uh, overshadow what the movie actually is we should meet the movie on its own premises uh however like first of all i uh, i'll say that you know it, it absolutely does play into it its own like ghibliness in a, in, in a lot of ways uh like character designs uh you know the the uh, the the, the plot the way the way it goes like it, it, it has a talking cat that's like an, a, a clone of gg from kiki's uh, delivery service um it, it, it the opening uh like the, the opening of the movie has like a reference to uh Ca castle of Cagliostro. um it, it like it, it knows it's a ghibli movie and, and it wants us to know that as well so i i think i don't think it's unfair to like uh add that in that legacy is part of the story you know part yeah. of the visual narrative yeah, um, I agree. I'm thinking I mean, that's a mistake, right? Like, as I mentioned, the character designs, it's kind of a mistake to stick to the Ghibli yeah. girl design. And I, I think you're right in pointing this out, right? And I would just say that is probably the worst decision making in the creation of this movie. Yeah, probably. And the, the other thing I also want to say is like, even even ignoring, you know, the legacy of Studio Ghibli, even like being as ch that charitable... I still think that this animation is like like a sli slightly below average for like three D animation. There's there's a lot of like cheap three uh, D animated like movies and TV shows made, especially outside of the U S. Uh, like I think like you, you can see like posters for some random you know um, like French or, or Canadian or something three D animated kids movie that like to fill seats uh, like in cinemas all the time. Uh, there, 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 there's a lot of stuff that's like worse than this, uh, but I, I, th I think the animation here is like passable uh, at, at best. It has its moments, it ha has its charm, um, but, but it, it's it just feels so like stiff at times. The the liveliness, the follow through in the animation is just like lacking that bit that that makes the movements of the characters like it 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 sells them, but it doesn't add a level of charm of like uh like th that that you want in an animated film it's not not pleasant just watching it which is one of the like uh like high points of like most ghibli movies even the ones with lackluster stories um yeah uh like i said i i, I feel the movie does do pretty good if you're looking at like japanese made 3d animated movies like i said they're, they're pretty behind a lot of that stuff yeah that's and, damning with faint praise yeah i i guess so uh Typically, I think it usually works better when it's like a like a mixed format. Like one of the best examples of recent years, probably Promare, that uses the three D in a way around the two D in an incredibly like good visual contrast. Uh, and like we said, Lupin the Third, and like uh, Lupin, Lupin the First, Lupin the First, uh, and then I don't know like Final Fantasy Spirits Within was incredibly expensive, so that still looks okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I still I, I think the movie works out. Also, I wanted to get a very nerdy nitpick on you, Platon. Okay. Uh, an, an interesting fact: the car chasing them at the beginning of the movie is not Lupin's Fiat Five Hundred, which uh, I assumed as well. It's actually the Citroen Two uh, CV, which was never featured in Lupin, but it's been featured in other Miyazaki works because it's the car Miyazaki actually owned for many years—a uh, yellow uh, Citroen car. So okay, I think it's funny that the movie opens cool. up with the main character being chased by an evil version of the director's dad's car. One that Goro probably, you know, was driven around in quite a bit as a kid. So I don't know if there's like a, a Freudian analysis there of this evil chomping car that is known as like the Miyazaki car for so many years. But uh, 
I, I in, in, in my defense, it wasn't the specific make of the car. It was the fact that it was like a, a small yeah, it's yellow like the, car. It's the yellow uh, the, the, European the, the style car. That like similar. drove up on, on the, like the, the 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 side of a hill next to the road. That mm. that, that had, I mean, that 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 is a not. It, it probably was it. definitely a bit of a reference to Cagliostro, yeah. Yeah. Um, just just to return really quickly to the uh, the visual aspects. Um, I think what Platon is also kind of getting at, and I kind of want to play a little bit of defense for the art style, even though I didn't really like it that much, is I think a lot of it has to do with that the the scope of this film is a lot smaller and it has a lot less ambition when it comes to uh, movement in in particular. And I don't, I'm not. I don't want to go off too quick and say that that is a bad thing. Um, like, in a lot of ways, it's a very stationary movie, whereas other Ghibli films are very involved and sometimes even obsessed with, and not in a bad way, but obsessed with capturing movement and adventure in a way. Um, and, of course, that makes all of those things that Platon say stand out about animation and how it looks and how it feels and how it kind of takes you on a journey. But I think this film is not really trying to do that. And I think it's more about kind of getting into that feeling of playing house or being inside a house that's kind of strange and particular and kind of discovering these weird things about it. And I think that kind of feeling is kind of amplified or like assisted by the art style um, in a way that it would not for a more uh, for a film that is more focused on movement um, so I also think that and this I also kind of uh, feeds into what Nihart said about um, <laughs> focusing on these locations um Though you can still debate on whether or not it's completely successful in this, I do think that there's a good reason to deviate from the previous ideas of Ghibli films that are that that are this um, kind of focus on movement. Yeah, build, building on that, I, th I think that's a really interesting thing you point out. Like, an opportunity for us to you know enjoy Miyazaki's senior's work a little bit in in this moment right here because. Every one of his major films has a strong movement theme, right? Like it's flight or it's like running on the water waves like in Ponyo or something like that. There's there's always something in that uh, for Miyazaki Sr. And noticing this, that there's this visual motif of motion in Miyazaki movies that is not here where it's more like intimate spaces, ornate like backgrounds and like focusing on a very limited set of rooms. I think that is really a key to understanding like the difference in scope and approach and why I guess the expectation of lush outlandish or crazy or insane or masterwork animation wasn't really on the table for this movie. Um, yeah, uh, I do wonder just mentioning this because in the introduction during the production I did mention that Miyazaki at some point needed to decide if he would adapt how uh, if he would adapt how do you live or uh, uh, Earwick and the Witch I would wonder because this would be a very atypical movie for Miyazaki how would he bring motion into this I have no answer I'm just putting this out there because we had him do a little witch story right like Kiki but Kiki was always flying on her broom so there's movement there's flight in there uh, I wonder because that would be weird for Miyazaki to not have uh, I, I would imagine Miyazaki would just change the story quite a lot, like he did with Howl's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, that, that's what I thought about the making of this, was like they, they stuck quite close to the book, because I guess maybe Goro was a bit like afraid of making deviations, like with Earthsea. But uh, Miyazaki just does not care. And like, like we say, like Howl's, he changed, uh, he added a whole war plot just to be political, <laughs> and he, he would do a lot different. So a Miyazaki version of this movie, I imagine, would look so different. It's hard to even, you know, know where to start. Yeah, and I, th I think this is a, a good as time as any to like uh, get a bit into the uh, the story itself, uh, like what happens in it, uh, uh, and why. Like that, there might be some changes you one could make or that they didn't make. Um, 
let's well, like very basic rundown of the plot. Uh, uh, you know, we start out with a with a red haired uh, motorcycling you know badass lady uh, escaping from this like weird demonic car and like casting a spell to get him off, get him off her tail. She drops off what, what turns out to be the thing she was carrying was a little baby, a little baby girl. Uh, drops it off at, at an orphanage with a little letter just saying, um, uh, you know, the, the there's there's a I think it was like twelve witches are after me. I'll I'll return when when I've shook them off, and uh, and also like a little uh, ca- cassette, you know, a little mixtape thing with a uh, with the baby's name on it, earwig. Which the the, the the orphanage matron is like, oh, that, that's weird. We'll we'll, we'll call her Erica. Um, <laughs> there's there's a similar wordplay thing going on in the Japanese version, which is why they call her Aya. Um, By the way, good move on uh, behalf, on behalf of the orphanage lady. Yeah. <laughs> uh, calling someone earwig is lame hipster parents need to stop like this stupid you know oh my baby's so unique with their dumb name your kid's yes. just gonna get bullied yeah. so uh, i'm i'm on the side of the orphanage lady though apparently she didn't call stop that kid from being called custard so, <laughs> you know she's not doing her job the whole time yeah good good point uh and uh yeah uh good transition because custard is uh this uh the, the, this kid who uh who erica becomes uh, friends with as, as she becomes like a, a more like a, an older girl and she just like she, she's a bit of a brat honestly uh like she she, she likes getting her way and she, she's good she's at punk. like yeah she, she, she's good at like uh well, manipulating people is like is a bit much, maybe, but like. Just, well, she is though. Like, yeah, she is a bit of a manipulator. She is manipulating yes. everyone. Yeah, she is. Like, I'm trying to be charitable here because, like, I don't want to be too critical. But yeah, she's she's a little shit, um, <laughs> and and like she's uh, she she doesn't really want to leave the orphanage because like she's comfortable there and like everyone like she she's got everything under control there and she even like uh, influences her friend to like. Uh, make attempts to not get adopted which i think is like just genuinely like that's that, that, that's that's terrible no nah, like, that's cool. a terrible thing to that's do cool. <laughs> anyway um so like uh but lo and behold um this uh, uh this blue haired like big big round bodied uh witch and uh rotund. And, uh, yeah rot- rotund is a g- good word for it uh named uh, uh bella yaga and um her companion, this like lanky, like de- demonic, uh, you know, dude, like just towering over everything, uh, with like a little hunched over mandrake. Uh, they come along and just like just 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 like pick her up and uh, and uh, and t- take her home with them, and uh, and she doesn't like that. And then it turns out they're like uh, Billy Yaga's a witch. She just wants an extra pair of hands, and they are like trapping her in this magic house to. Uh, help with like boring menial potion making tasks. Um, here we was like, okay, if I learn some magic, that that's okay. Turns out, ah, she, she was never going to learn any magic. Uh, then later, she learns that the the familiar of the house, the the, the cat uh, Thomas, can actually talk, and uh, and and is like sympathetic to her like mission of like getting out of there, f- finding a way to to like, uh, you know you know get back at her captors uh, and so they plot together they make some like anti magic potion they make a a a, po- a curse potion thing to uh uh to set against uh, Bella Yaga um which uh, uh at some point kind of backfires because uh she accidentally angers Mandrake who is like a very 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 do not piss him off uh type of magic dude uh, he controls all the demons that do a lot of the, the stuff around the house, uh, and he he gets real mad. Um, but she manages to sneak into his like private abode, which is like a space between the rooms or something, uh, where she learns that whoa, not only uh, did, did these guys, th- these two were like once in a band together, but it's Earwig. It's the band that was on the mixtape that I got when I left the orphanage. Uh, and and so she she like uh, talks to Mandrake and it's like wow like that's that's, that's that's pretty cool and she uh, and she sort of like softens them up uh, a, a bit with just like being curious and kind and then there's like a big time skip to where like she is just very comfortable there and like they uh, like they become like a family and then 
there's uh, on Christmas Eve there's a, there's a ring on the doorbell and uh, and she's expecting a custard you know her friend from the orphanage who was a bit scared of, of her new family and wasn't visiting but like now here it comes but also who should be there but the same cool red haired witch that w- was her mother in the first place and then the movie ends yay end credits end credits which and I'm I'm not kidding my favorite part of this movie is when the credits rolled <laughs> Because, because, because the because, end credits are this yeah. like collection of hand drawn, like Ghibli style hand drawn illustrations of what a slice of life movie about this found family would look like. Yes. And you know what? I agree. Those are lovely. And I would love to see a TV series exploring this slice of life concept because yeah, I, re- I really like. I really like the movie that the end credits implied we could have been watching <laughs> instead. Like what? What, what what the hell this this like so, so, sort of like you know w- w- wishy washy like little uh, conflict turns into non conflict. I, I, g- give me that like uh, like uh, uh, the Adams family, but it's a, a Ghibli slice of life. Like give me that. I, give me I that. also felt like this because I felt like the payoff of the film would be the the film that the end credits would be or what it would be after. Like you kind of. There's also like narrative expectations, right? Where you yes. where you feel like, okay, at first they're like cold to each other, but then in the end they'll warm up and you'll see them grow. But they kind of just skip that. And it's kind of weird for me. And for me, because of that, the film just feels kind of cynical. Because it's about it's about the part way where where they all hate each other and go behind each other's backs to try and and hurt each other and uh, don't like each other and be fake to each other and then uh, just try to, you know, be as mean to each other as possible. And then when, when, when they learn to not do that, the film ends and I'm like, okay, <laughs> but I want to see that. I want to, I want to see the, the, how how they warm up and like be friendly again i want to see that i don't want to see the cynical side only i don't know maybe there's more to this maybe i'm missing the point i don't know but to me it felt it felt weird it felt not right or something Uh, you're getting at one of my big big issues with this movie which is like uh again just like the thing is adapted from it feels so unfinished the, the, there's there's a lot of dangling threads, chief among them being the mother character and her decision to leave Ewig in an orphanage, and her like decision to get back, and like her like the the, the like falling out she had with the original band slash Coven, and then being after her. The opening of the movie, which is like one of the coolest parts, you know, because it has like a a, a car with like a little like maw that's trying to get at this like witch on a motorbike that's that's dope i I want to see more of that and it promises these things it sets this this whole conflict up like oh there's all these witches who are after me i will return and it never comes full circle like it it doesn't really there's even this moment uh when when earwig like reaches mandrake's uh like room and sees like the poster and realizes they're they're the band where she like explicitly doesn't connect the dots that like she's related to to this, like she doesn't realize that that red haired chick there is her her like biological mother, like that scene is what we were promised by the movie at the very beginning, like th- this movie would be cleaner and like like fit together more and have less lingering questions afterwards if they just dropped that entire like thread like entirely just have it just be a normal orphan who happens to be picked up by this like witch and uh, and demon wizard guy which is like interesting enough but like with having that prologue it, it raises all sorts of questions like do do do, do mandrake and belayaga know that Ewig is is related to like the 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 girl who left their coven slash band is that why they pick her up it's that that's never really implied it just seems that like they just picked like it didn't seem to be a decision they, they made um uh if you allow me to elucidate Platon, uh i think that's kind of uh the whole problem here because a lot of my reading and a lot of your questions are informed by me having a read the book itself which is 
pretty much exactly all the events we see in the film. But all the stuff about the band and the later appearances of Iwi's mother was entirely added. So everything involving the music, the band, their past was all completely added into the movie. That just raises more the, uh, questions the, uh, because the, adding the book that just itself, makes me more confused. Yeah, because like the book itself, like maybe it was unfinished by Diane Wynne Jones and maybe she had future installments planned. We'll never know. But the book itself is actually like a complete little children's story. Like it's made to be read over bedtime. It's a very simple tale. A girl is an orphanage. She get, she gets uh, adopted by a witch. The witch is mean to her. She tricks the witch and then she's happy at the end. It's a very simple story. Like children like under the ages of like probably seven are supposed to read this and find it whimsical. Uh, it does have the beginning bit about Earwig's mother dropping her off and saying witches are on me. But I'm sure that could also, you know, that's just like a little flavor. Like, oh, her mother was a witch, and that's why she can do magic now, maybe. Doesn't even need to be explored. But yeah, I think the central thing around this movie, and why it's so odd, and why it feels it has so many missing pieces, is because Goro, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, did he write the script? But no, like, no, e- either way, uh, th- they decided to add this whole band musical element and the history of all these characters into the movie. But then you're right, then they don't explain it. They don't get into it. They don't, like, have it of develop in an interesting way or continue so they weirdly wanted to make a bold choice to add much more than what the book had but they didn't want to add too much like they didn't want to do a whole house moving castle where they completely rearranged the story for the sake of the movie so i feel like that's why we're at odds because yeah, there were these two kind did, of conflicting approaches that just did not gel in any way yeah they didn't commit to it which is yeah, what you need really, to do really when you do that the whole band okay. element i feel especially when it's the prologue it's the opening you know i'm really happy about all of this because i have such a different take from all of you because i think the band is the key to why i like this movie and you all don't as much as i do and i'm so fucking pleased that, that i get to talk about this because i was worried like do you see the same things that I see, but feel very differently about them? And it turns out, now I, I, maybe I can actually explain how I see it, and maybe this will help you, okay? Uh, uh, or rather, maybe it enables you to see a bit more of my perspective, because here, really, I didn't hear any of the things that I picked up on, and that's cool, that's fun. That's Now I have the opportunity to provide unique content. Hell yeah. Okay, let me get into this. So, the reason I think the band plot was added, right, is to be a guiding motif through the entire life of Aya, through, for her development, for her inspiration, for motivation, and so on. And it builds the connective tissue to a previous generation. So think about it from a child's perspective, right? You're an orphan. This is a story for children that shows you a child that is able to incredibly cope with terrible situations. She grows up in an orphanage, but she's really socially competent. She makes friends, she like plays pranks, she breaks the rules, but all of the authorities still love her because she is wonderful at playing their emotions. She is sort of a rebellious little rascal, a brat, like she, she breaks rules and enjoys life that way. For it, for how children's stories about orphanages are usually written, where it is this bleak, depressing, lonely place where nobody loves you, this is a strong deviation. And I picked up on this immediately how she does not want to leave the orphanage and she does not want Custer to leave the orphanage because that's her own punk zone where she can be like little rebellious and shitty and a brat, you know, and really cool. I like her. I completely adore her. And I think this is the key to understanding how this entire movie is structured, right? The idea is, okay, but now this kid who is like really fucking great at coping with the orphanage and made it a fun life for her is adapted, adopted into a terrible family. I'm thinking... When we talk about children's stories, and I've read a little article called The Value of Horror in Children's Movies, uh, about this movie as well. Um, I think the thesis, the thesis is strong that this is a movie that whose central lesson is to be brave in the face of like extremely emotionally challenging situations. You have been adopted into a family that is really not treating you kindly. Like, you have this imagery of the Mandrick being this evil motherfucker who, if you piss him off, he will just destroy you like abusive brutal horrible the mother is like the mother figure is a witch who is like just abusing you for work and it doesn't doesn't show any affection doesn't teach you threatening anything. you with with worm spells with yeah. you don't do what you're told and also abusing the cat yes. <laughs> with the same threat and we're put here with aya who we know to be a master survivor a kid who really knows how to make the best of a situation or like really tries to stick to making the best of a situation right so from a children's perspective this is a character that is meant to inspire like courage confidence and you know 
perseverance more than anything, right? From an adult's perspective, and of course we are all adults, we kind of see, obviously we couldn't expect a kid to flourish in that environment. But that is where the magical whimsy kind of comes in. And I think the best way this is accomplished is through the music. And I'm going to try and explain this. Because the two uh, par parent figures are the Mandrake and uh, Bella Yaga, who are both like bitter older people, but we get constantly flashbacks and glimpses to their past where they were like 70s rockers, where they were like playing crazy prog rock and passionate and free spirits and so on. And now we have this contrast. Their own child, the adopted child, is locked up in this house, is kind of put under all of these rules. What happened to these adults to turn them from the cool, you know, hippie prog rock type people into these bitter and nasty people who are like really oppressive, really mean, really rude to the child? And the child, Aya, is constantly listening to the record that they recorded back in the day and is getting inspiration from it. He, she's like, yeah, I'm listening to this tune. This tune gives me the energy to, you know, rise up against the adults. And the big reveal that kind of pulls this together is, hold on, by, you know, connecting with these adults, I learned that this was them. They were the young rebellious generation at some point. I can reconnect to them. They've gotten bitter because they've become disillusioned by the world. They were betrayed by their singer who left them. Similar to me, who was literally left by that singer. Of course, we never learn explicitly, but that's the poetic irony here, right? Like, this singer who abandoned her, symbolically the mother abandoned her, left her in an orphanage and cast her out into a world where she wouldn't be, is similar to the bandmates who are really still kind of negative and pissed about the fact that their singer left them, betrayed them, you know, left them behind. So reconnecting them to their artistic merits, like how Bella Yaga is a great drummer, how the Mandrake can restart his career as a writer. Like if you just, you know, butter him upright and help him along and, you know, talk to him in a way that he's interested in. That you can connect to these people and reawaken the rebellious spirit. So it turns out that the song that inspired her to rise up against these people is the song that those people wrote. And there's a great sense of generational connection that arises there for me, where it, the movie falls into place for me because I light up. I start smiling and being happy when the Mandrake is able to show off his he keyboard skills and Bella Yaga starts drumming and I'm like, yeah, I, you're bringing them back. This is a found family because you enrich each other. You manage to bring this out of them and they have already inspired you by the music that they did in the past. There's a true generation of dialogue that really, really made me feel strongly positively about this movie. Similar to like the general perseverant attitude of Aya herself. I, I just really like these characters and how the prog rock subplot that Goro Miyazaki himself added and that's completely his original shit how that really ties everything together for me. And I, that's good. I, I fucking love that. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Rant done. As a lover of prog rock, I do also respect that. Uh, they should have got Uriah Heep to write the, the songs. Because apparently they're still writing songs, something I found about recently. Oh, geez. They have like a new album out. Okay, uh, so all of that you're pointing out, Nyard, is clearly like in the text and clearly like intended. And, uh, and like great that it resonated with you. I feel like that could work. I would love to watch the movie that really committed to that. And, I, and, I, and I th but I think like as with a lot of like parts of this movie, the, the, it feels like there's like important parts missing from that story. Um, like we don't see Aya actually bringing music back into this home. We just like see her and acknowledge that like wow, mu music is cool. And then like five minutes later, the movie ends. It feels like that's that, not even no, true. Like. Like we see Balayaga no, yeah. drumming, we see like uh, her watching the Mandrake and complimenting him on it, on it, on his thing, on his music. I, she's bringing it back. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, implied just, a bit. But just uh, going in there, giving them a compliment, it, it, I think it feels uh, like unearned to me, especially after a full movie of uh, her being trapped and abused. It just, it, it feels unearned. I think there's like a, just a bit more time to like flesh out this like thawing of the ice. Uh, instead of just having it be like this this magic solution that like works really quickly. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, not to yeah. be an armchair scriptwriter, but uh, Platon, I think oh, exactly yes, that's what, what, what you want. For. No, no, I, I agree. But I think something exactly what you want is something I exactly felt uh, right at the end of the movie. And there's a line like really bothers me and makes me feel exactly what you feel for that, Platon, where it's like Mandrake says to Earwig when he's looking at the poster, uh, she left when he's talking about Earwig's mother. He goes, and you can only replace a witch with another witch, implying that Earwig would would 
like be with them like she's their new third member and even the poster of the movie yeah. is earwig singing into a microphone in front of the the rest of them which i feel like that should have been the ending of the movie there should have been an extra 10 minutes where she gets the band together but now earwig is singing as the, the leader of the band they're a new family unit that has rediscovered the music and they kind of imply that that might happen, but then they just end the movie. Yeah, yeah that, that's the other part that's missing from that version of the movie that Nyad is like uh, talking about that he liked is just a, a small subplot of Aya just like learning to play music because she gets inspired by this, and like th- then it becomes more earned that instead of just a, an acknowledgement that music is cool, it becomes this thing they have in common. Like, it it's so close. There's Every, every, even the good parts, even the charming parts of this movie frustrate me because they, like, they're like they so close to good, so adjacent to good, and it just makes me want to like fix it, but I can't. I think there's also this, of course, this issue, in my opinion, where there's not enough time to flesh out the relationship when it actually develops between between these characters. Like, I agree with Nyar that uh, that there is this generational kind of bonding that happens, and you see the start of that with Aya kind of trying to loosen them up. But in my opinion, it feels cynical because there is a very there there is it, it feels very ingenuous because all of the time in the movie we see Aya kind of girl bossing her way to the sun. You, you right, but she does it in a kind of like um, it doesn't feel like she has a genuine connection with anyone. Like she basically manipulates the head of the orphanage, even with Custard, who she says she really likes. Um, it's basically the only scene we have with them is her basically calling him a pussy because she doesn't want to <laughs> go in a scary place, even though yeah. he's a small child. <laughs> so it does seem there and, and her basically pushing him around and then when she gets to the house of course they treat her like garbage and then she kind of gets along with the cat but also between the cat and Aya it seems there's a lot of tension like at some point they almost like insult each other and it seems like they don't really enjoy their time together scheming it's, they they say how how much of a hassle it is and how they don't like doing anything and at the, and, and and kind of connecting that to the end, it seems like Aya just kind of has that same feeling, but towards the parent, but towards her like foster parents, and she basically just finds a way to manipulate them by kind of awakening their past flame, and it doesn't really feel like it's. It's it's uh, it's a really warm transition from like an abusive relationship to something that seems like they both forgive each other and can understand each other in a way. It feels more like she, like she, she won. finds a she, she yeah she it's it's like a competition. She found she found a way to not be abused because she found the vulnerability of these people, and it yeah. doesn't feel like it 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 comes from both sides this relationship and. Uh, that's why the ending feels so weird to me because you see that relationship in the in the end credits, but it's kind of implied that it eventually becomes something that is genuine and does go both ways, but uh, you don't see it in the actual film, and that makes it for me feel so cynical and so, um, yeah, like just kind of depressing in a way. I I I I have to again disagree because. I don't think it felt very cynical. Like, the Aya can manipulate other people is definitely part of it, but, like, in a cool, in a, in a fun way, I think. Because she's definitely the kind of character, if I would have to compare with anything, it would be, and this is a surprising comparison for me, it, I would be to Haruhi from, you know, Haruhi Suzumiya. Uh, because she's the kind of character who will pull other people into having fun with her. Like, if they want to or not. And I think that is a trait in the sort of universe this movie is portraying uh, that is whimsical and fun like I don't recommend mapping everything you see in this movie onto like a real relationship because obviously a child would never be able to fix the abusive you know parents they have by being like Aya 
But this movie is a power fantasy for children who are like orphans who might feel like the world is abandoning them and that they have just gotten the roughest lot in life. But then they can like turn things around and manipulate people in this fun way. And I think it is especially noteworthy how her relationship to Mandrake is because Mandrake isn't actually you know, terrible to her in any way. Mandrake, we know, is easy to anger, and, like, he's really scary looking, but he doesn't ever do anything really bad. I think he's just, like, having a hard time talking to anyone, like, these days. he He's, like, a really frustrated artist, but, like, as soon as you can kind of connect to him, he's, like, just a kind, sweet dude. Like, we kind of learn how he has just this gentle personality, honestly, and that this anger issue is really just more of like a gimmick of him being a demon. And I think that's the interesting thing that I kind of liked about this, how everything about this, this, this family dynamics has gained a dimension of magical whimsy through them being witches and demons and like ch the children of witches and spells are everywhere and the punishment isn't anything real, but it's like worms, you know? Worms are really silly as a punishment, I think. And I think that adds to me not experiencing like abuse as a central theme of the movie but rather just Aya's pranking and scheming and succeeding her like journey to finding the way in which she can you know integrate herself into this household by becoming the de facto leader and I think that's I, I think that's just fun and cool you know I, I, I can't really see it as cynical because I'm thinking about the child reader, the child perspective, the child's world that is being presented to us, right? Like, which is one where tons of terrible things happen, but she's just persevering and doesn't care. She is, like, bouncy. She puts up a caricature of Bella Yaga in her bathroom mirror and looks at it every day. Her little acts of defiance. And that is fun. Like, it is a fuck you. I'm punk kind of attitude this child has. And I enjoyed that thoroughly. And the ending when they connected to each other worked so well for me that I was like smiling the entire way. So I guess that's where I'm standing, how positively I feel about it. I can see why it would maybe not connect, but I'm I'm, I'm thinking if you get on the wavelength, if you like accept the movie's whimsy, my reading isn't too far off. No, I, I, it, again, similar to earlier, like I, I don't think it's, far off but that's mostly because this movie isn't far off from working it's, it's not far off from being good it's just it's just not quite there and i think like something that's missing here is um like i i, I understand the reading and the appeal of like having her as this like iconic chaotic character who just like is crafty and like and, like witty like a, a bit of a trickster um but the the movie doesn't really play into that like uh like like uh consistently enough like when she gets to the house uh she does like go exploring but she doesn't like immediately start coming up with like ways of subverting things it's only once she like finds out that like oh actually you you're not going to learn magic which she should have seen through that lie uh if she was this like iconic you know um you know tricks type I mean, she, she just, should have been like ah that, that smells like bullshit just for a second right like the first thing she says oh you've invited me here to be like your servant okay but you teach me magic like that's line one and i guess she believes it for a time right yeah, so yeah. I, I i think the movie is doing that consciously what you just asked yeah. it to do you know so I, I think in in that version like some I don't know, something that's missing um would be uh, like the, the 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 struggle that if if we just had one point in the movie where it really felt like Earwig was like like sad, desperate, like d despairing just a little bit, and then like stealing herself and and being like, okay, I've gotten like the orphanage was bad as well, but I figured it out. Now it's time to like do 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 the like puzzle solving, fi figure these people out. But instead, it's just like this. Uh, turns out the cat can talk and now we're making a, a potion to solve it which isn't like really doesn't really do anything with the characters or like their decision making um, and another thing is like if if you have this character that you don't want to change because there's a version of this movie where like Earwig learns a lesson about the difference between being manipulative to get what you want and like being part of a loving relationship which means people give you things you want you give them things they want that, that that's a different movie from the one yeah. uh, you're talking about here she's not learning like, anything so, so 
we're disregarding that. No character arc for her. She starts with the movie with like, I want to manipulate people around me and want to be in charge. Yes. She ends the movie with like, yes, I accomplished it. I am now in charge. Hell yeah. Which to me feels pretty empty, but like, if that's what you want, fine. Then what's missing is the, who has the arc then instead? It would have to be like the, uh, like the, the adoptive family, uh, like uh, Bella Yaga and Mandrake. But it's just so shortened it's like the last 10 minutes ish of the movie is like when they have like this 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 change of heart and then like she starts drumming a bit and uh and and he has a little talk and uh mandrake seems to like not realize that that bella yaga is being like abusive to her and that she doesn't like being trapped and once he learns that he's that's another thing that i feel is incongruent in the movie is if Mandrake really is this like sweetheart underneath the like uh, harsh exterior, why is he just like letting Bella Yaga be such an asshole uh, to 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 this innocent kid? It, it just doesn't it it doesn't fit. There's something missing. There's some scenes missing. There's some character development missing that would make that work for me. It's just not there. It's just it's sloppy. Uh, yeah, I, I totally feel the same way playing. Because you know, I, I do understand your reading, and I totally feel that the movie has some some really cool vibes about the um the way that um it's this rebellious like rock uh, kind of story. Earwig is yeah this this like shitheaded brat, but that's like a good you know punk thing. They even got like uh, what was her name like the 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 one who sings the songs is like an actual like uh, rock singer who yeah. then also voices Earwig's mother, and it's you know it's almost a little like feminist message as well like this this very you know uh like that kind of 70s era girl power kind of thing i, I think that's very charming and i think that works with the themes of the movie of her being in like a i guess you could say in a, in a lot of context of society or a world that isn't meant to care about her like being an orphan is like the prototypical like fiction example of uh someone who isn't cared about by the world but like uh earwig makes people care about her and that's like her thing uh but yeah i also just have to agree with Platon with the whole thing is like but why do they end up caring about her because all the stuff with like mandrake and bella yaga it, it, yeah it doesn't develop in a way that uh, i think connects those things because like the, the idea that they used to be in a band is is like a really ingenious adaptation like like reading the book and just having these two oddball characters live together and you're like why are they living together oh some reason but the movie completely reframes everything around it. They used to be in a band together. They used to be happy. They used to have a purpose. They used to have this free spirit that defined them. And now they're kind of like basically just clinging onto each other as the only other people they know. But they're like not really happy. They mostly just avoid each other in this like miserable house. The Mandrake still wants to make music and write, but he has no joy in it. He's completely like frustrated as an artist. And Beliaga is just essentially serving these random people who she doesn't like and who don't approve of her being a witch it's like an important line where she says like if i rode in on a broomstick they would think lesser of me or something so there are these snooty people who, who use baliaga's magic but don't appreciate her in any way and like the fiercely independent spirit of Ewig's mother like we see in the flashback where she's like fuck you i'm not going to play by the rules i'm going to defy the uh, witches of our coven i'm going to do my own thing I'm a rock star uh, that doesn't tie back together into the movie. Cause like we say, Ewig doesn't make the characters reunite. She doesn't really make them discover their passion. We just kind of told that that happens right in the last four seconds of the movie. Uh, so I just feel like, yeah, it's just a fundamental like script problem. I mean, I think she is shown to give them some passion back because she helps Mandrake write. She's, you know, now reading and you know, giving advice and editing his writing. And also learning magic is a way to connect to Bella Yaga, right? Like, because he is someone who actually values your art. Uh, if we consider, you know, magic Bella Yaga's art, the art from which she is alienated by, you know, having shitty clients and doing stupid spells the entire time. And similar to how, like, Aya says that most of the spells in the book rub her the wrong way, right? Like a spell to make my dog win the fucking dog competition. Stuff like that. <laughs> um, I'm thinking... Um, I'm I'm agreeing that there are script writing issues, but they're not like, you know, when I 
feel that these characters have this to them and I experience this and I smile and I laugh and I, you know, enjoy these characters, I'm not then looking at the script and saying, well, you know, it was missing this one scene, so I really have to deduct points from the enjoyment that I've already experienced. So, like, the frame from which I am enjoying this, right, I have to make this clear, it's like, to a child's mind, like, imagine this movie is, like, a told by an unreliable narrator. Maybe that's the way I would explain it, right? Like you're adopted in a family and it's this like terrible witch and this scary demon. But only gradually do you, re do you realize, you know, this is honestly like a silly demon who gets kind of angry if, you know, the, the, the critics are not liking his writing and who also wants to eat delicious, delicious shepherd's pie. So like there's this moment of humanizing these so imposing figures, right? Like, so I think it's a symbolic way of de depicting, you know, adoptive parents and a new family that is really spooky and scary. And so I don't take like worm punishments and spells and like evil mandrake who like puts uh you know the fear of god into everyone i don't take those as quite so literal that they would be abusive i would just take that as we have a super colored perception of these beings and i think the fun in this movie comes from them being all these magical beings and that magic is being used as a way for example to connect with bella yaga and you know that spells and by the way i want to point this out the spell that protects from magic it is very unclear what that even did like we know that, yeah, that that's another problem with no no that's not a problem i think, that I is, think it is. that is not a problem i was just about to get into how that is cool so the the thing is what made aya actually succeed here it was kind of the courage to come up with a prank with a spell to you know show her to you know l not let her be abused to show what she's really thinking and feeling and you know kind of learn magic on her own because she came in there saying i want to learn magic she wasn't taught magic so she started bullshitting and teaching herself magic I'm thinking the spell that protects you from magic didn't fucking work. I'm thinking it was complete nonsense. I'm thinking the entire thing about her and Thomas making up words and like Thomas like making up dumb words even like swear words and like cat speak. That's just a funny way to say they're just kind of like playing. This is just an indication. Okay, they now have courage to go and do something on their own. Like in the end, the punishment of worms. If you read between the lines, Thomas is just scared of worms. Like it doesn't have anything particular to do. He's just really scared of worms. Like Thomas flinches when worms are mentioned. Worms Literal fall from phobia. the worms fall from the roof, and that's the punishment. You know, there isn't much more to this. So I don't think the protection from magic spell worked. I'm thinking that's the punishment, and she just rolled with the punches. And I find that really funny. Uh, that is just a funny thing to me. <laughs> okay, uh, Nyad, uh, I know I'm repeating myself, kind of, but like again, all those things are like in the text or like just adjacent to it. And I really like the movie that you're pitching to me here, but that's not the movie that I watched. That is the and, uh, movie that like, I watched, buddy. And I think part of the reason why is that, like, that movie that you watched, there's a much stronger version of that movie that this could have been, but it, it but it's not it. And you should be just as disappointed no. as no, I no, am no, 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 no. that it didn't do commit that. to it enough in, the, in enough ways. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's I my am, pitch to you. I am very happy with the movie I've gotten. Sure, could have been, could it have been better? Yeah. I'm thinking most movies of all times could be better. That's not the standard from which I judge. I'm judging from the standard. Did I enjoy what I saw? Did I smile? Did I laugh? Did I like the characters? Did I enjoy the themes? And yes, yes to all of those. Could it have done more? Sure. But, you know, that's a, a bit weird of a frame to me. I, I don't really like that frame. Yeah, fair. I, I do... I do really appreciate your your take, Nerd. I also actually thought it was pretty funny, where uh, the 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 worms drop from the ceiling because you're kind of left to think like, what what is what this punishment is actually supposed to be, and you're like, are the are they supposed to like crawl on you or like what's what what's the matter? I do kind of like that ambiguity. I do I do feel like that. Um, largely though, there there I, I do also. Feel, uh, I do also feel very strongly the kind of power fantasy, like the child power fantasy of being like just a punk bratty kid who does what, what whatever she wants and kind of manipulates the adults and stuff like that. And it is kind of justified also because, um, you know, she is also treated pretty badly. But I do feel kind of sad at the end of the day because I do really feel like in the text, I never really get the impression that there is someone that 
Aya really really vibes with or has like a connection with. If if I'm gonna just go off the cuff, it feels kind of like a a, a girl boss narrative of like you know just winning and and like owning people and being cool, but like not really really doing it for any purpose, just doing it because you want to be cool and because um, you feel like you've won. But in the end, in my opinion she doesn't really have anyone to share that with. It's not like it's an underdog story where yeah, like kind of with a cat, but like I got the impression that they just kind of stuck together to like get back at someone, but didn't really have that much fun doing it. They say multiple times that they think it's a, it's a hassle, which kind of feels contradictory to it being a fun and, whimsical adventure um and i just feel kind of sad because in the end she doesn't really have anyone she likes in my opinion except for this random kid who she bullies for not <laughs> going into the tower and then I'm like okay and it, it tries it, it, to force it, him tries to make him not get adopted which he wants to he wants to be adopted yeah, it, it feels it just feels very sad to me i i, I I, I, I get where you're coming from, and I, I'm, I'm very glad that you had that experience, and as you can see it from a different angle. Uh, and I can see maybe how a child would feel like, oh yeah, those stupid people are annoying, and I'm glad that the, that the kid got, got one up on them, and won in the end, and got them to do what she wanted. And that's fine. If, if, if that works for, for kids, then that's completely fine. But to me, uh, it feels kind of sad because she doesn't have any friends and um, she just manipulates everyone um, and, and to, when they're trashy to her and then she gets what she wants but she doesn't make any friends and that seems kind of sad to me. Um, can I, yeah, Clayton? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because it would be a direct response. Okay. Um what I would say is that I think she has friends, and I think you're underestimating that. Because while Custard is a little bit, you know, controlled by her, we also have that scene where they just genuinely have a good laugh on that roof uh, that they, you know, climb on top of after having dressed as ghosts and, like, being all pranksters and so on. Like, they're having fun. And I think that is an important note to set this relationship off on. And you know that Aya really cares about him because she wants to go to school to see him again. She has a picture of him put up there. She, she cares about him. Like, only because their relationship is framed that Custard is, is a bit of a coward and, you know, Aya really wants to stay with him at the orphanage and so on. She's teaching him to stay at the orphanage because she wants to stay with him, right? Like, that's kind of the idea behind that. And that is definitely a genuine friendship also indicated by him being able to, you know, come visit them at Christmas. So, like, I think the relationship to Custard, at the very least, is fleshed out enough to make sense. She also keeps comparing Thomas to him. So there's an indication that she sees Thomas as a friendly character as well, though I agree that with Thomas, the relationship is more uh, purpose-bound. But the one thing I want to add is it's not just manipulating these adults. She loves the music by Earwig. She loves that band. She admires that band. This band gives her energy. Her liking that music and her complimenting those two on having been in this really cool band is her moment of genuinely connecting to them. They're not just stupid adults who abused her. They're also people who are once young, passionate, musicians, creative artists, amazing people, cool people, and she looks up to those people. And she, I think, is able to reawaken that in them because Bella Yaga does start drumming on pots and pans. And, you know, the Mandrake is you know, more passionate about writing novels now and is getting good advice from her. And I'm thinking that is moments of genuine connection through art, through artistry. And that's just my direct response. I don't think it's that lonely in the end. Um, just w one quick note to that, yeah, because you reminded me of one of the things I thought, another little script doctor moment, like how much like stronger that plot point would be if Eowick actually... Uh, well, if Erica actually listened to the like cassette growing up instead of like only receiving it like when she's moving out with a new family, 
Like, like, just uh, to compare it to like if anyone here has seen like Guardians of the Galaxy, there's like similar like thing where this uh, young kid gets like abducted by aliens, and one of the only things he has to remember his dead mom is is this little cassette tape, and that becomes very important to like to, to his identity and stuff. And like, I just imagine a version of this movie where she grows up, and that's one of her prized possessions is this like uh, cassette tape of this band, and she, and she loves the music. And then, then the like learning that this family was actually that band would just be like so so much more like significant instead of just like her, like be, being like, oh, what a coincidence, you know? Let's uh, like Wait, I, 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 mean, I like that music that I started that, listening though. to yesterday. You know, it is kind That's, of doing that uh, though because she's in the bedroom plotting her revenge while listening to the music, being like, "Fuck you, Belayaga, fuck you," and that's cool. yes, That's yes, cool. I, I'm just saying it would be more like. Uh, it, it would have like some some deeper like roots in the character if they just made that simple decision of having her like know that music and have that be her theme music from the start. That, I think that would would have been like stronger. Um, but like it, it would, we, we're getting back in, into this where like uh, where these things like y- you uh, you bought these things that the film was uh, selling uh, very willingly and you had a great time with it and that's that's great. I just think that it didn't sell them that well it didn't earn them um dramatically it didn't challenge the characters and reveal stuff about them in interesting ways it just like stuff it was just stuff that happened where hey. w- as i experienced it and i keep imagining these ways in which it could be deepened it could be furthered it could be uh like so, like so much more felt and and that's what frustrates me about the uh, uh, about the movie and like I don't. I, I don't seem to be uh, be alone. Um, hey, you calling me easy? You calling me? No, nah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not calling you <laughs> easy. I'm, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm saying you really vibe with this movie. I respect that. Uh, I liked the. There were some good vibes in it. They didn't connect with me, and all the problems are like so much more irritating to me than like mo- most of like what was kind kind of charming about it. Uh, actually, I don't respect it. I want y'all to not enjoy this movie at all. <laughs> fully, yeah, stop I'm enjoying fully, things. I'm putting a ban on that. Um, but yeah, I, again, I guess I just feel myself uh, uh, halfway b- between you two because I, 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 like I said, I do enjoy a good part of it. And I agree with Nyard that like the movie pretty much does resolve most of it, the major things. Like at the end, uh, Bella Yaga shows Earwig respect. She says, "All right, let's let's show you some magic. I'll be your teacher." She starts drumming. Mandrake, uh, you know, he he gets his creative juices back. He, he feels like an accomplished person again. The, but the the key thing, like I said before, like is it's it's not just the band thing. Like they don't need a scene where they need to literally be a band again. But the movie does completely leave Bella Yaga and Mandrake uh, their relationship completely like left uh, in pieces still. Because as, as we said, the movie is like they live in this house together. It, it's kind of implied it's like this weird codependency where like she's in fear of his demonic powers but he still needs her for various things and they mostly ignore each other and they only have this like withered old relationship from being in a band when they were young and that's the only thing they have left to connect to each other uh and then the movie just doesn't resolve that in the end because in the end mandrake just tells bella yaga oh i'm an angry demon do what i say teach you how to be a magician and then the, the, we don't get any resolution there. So I feel like that was the one thing in the movie that of all the things I would change, that is the most like unresolved, uh, like unpleasing thing. Cause even the other scenes, like I said, uh, you can still take or leave how much you enjoy the personal resolution, but I would argue all the points are resolved, but just this one thing to me feels like just kind of a chasm in the middle of the, the movie's ending. I agree. Please make the credit sequence a sequel. Yeah, yeah pretty much. I, I, I think um, I, I still think that the biggest omission in the movie, like the, the most mind boggling, like mistake of the script is that Eowick, like we don't see her learn the truth about her mom because that's like, again, that it, it's, it's like, it's promised to us in the prologue. Like you don't put that in the, as the prologue for this, introducing this little character and having her like, and the entire plot is her like connecting with people who knew her mom from back then and then not have a scene where like she learns it and we see what that does to her. Like, how does she react and why does she resent her mom from abandoning her? Does she, why not? 
why or why not? Like, it's it's such a like it, it's not just a missed opportunity. It's like it's a layup, you know. It's just it's a softball, you know. It's it's the easiest thing to do in screenwriting is like set something up at the very beginning with like some familial relationship, and then before the end of the movie, have a scene where like it gets addressed. It's it it really baffles me. I mean, like I don't really want to go into the screenwriting or anything like that because honestly. I personally believe there's a little bit more room in how you write a movie than maybe Platon thinks. But to me personally, oh, at least, fighting words. <laughs> to me personally, uh, it's not really that frustration, but I also feel kind of in between where, and, and maybe I, I want to take an open stance on this because I do think that's important. I just, Maybe some things stand out to me more. Maybe some things stand out to others more. But me thinking about it, what stands out is just that I feel kind of sad uh, that I I would like to see like what I think we all agree on. I want to see the movie that the end credit has where people are actually nice to each other. Uh, because in my opinion, um, they really are, kind of aren't in this movie. Uh, I would like to see more heartwarming kind of uh, genuine affection scenes. Um, Because I kind of just missed that. And I think that would have kind of completed it for me. Um, But yeah, that's not too much to say. But um, I do feel like that very strongly. Uh, I just want to quickly reply to Platon, um, because you got me thinking about the whole mother subplot, I think. Um, so my first instinct is to say, interesting enough, that knowing who her real mother is, is probably not sh- something she should find out. I'm just thinking from the perspective of what would happen if she learned it. Would she be disappointed? Would she be angry? Would she be like, hey, why did you abandon me? Or is it perhaps better that we know her mother did care but went off to have her life somewhere and Yoik still found a way to be happy? I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about that. That would probably be an interesting question to uh, ponder that the movie kind of leaves us open to ponder, right? Like, nobody in the household there knows that they are her... Uh, that she is her mother. She would probably be the only one who would actually know that, you know, going in there. So... I'm thinking it is pretty interesting that we're left on that being open, right? Because she admires this music, most likely the singer, because, you know, her mother is the singer. The lyrics kind of uh, play a role here too. So I'm I'm thinking, and maybe this is, this is genuinely acceptable as a criticism, but also I'm thinking it being open is interesting to me. Like, I'm just not going further than saying interesting, right? Like, because... I could imagine it going either way because either she would be like, oh, dope, you are the one who sings the song that means so much to me. So there's the idea of your mother always cared for you and always was with you through this piece of music. But the alternative would be, well, your mother has a shitty lifestyle and abandoned you. I think not resolving this is perhaps the more, let's say, emancipated approach to this. Well, I I disagree that it's left open because like the ending of the movie, not only does she open the door, um, her mom addresses her by her like birth name. She calls her Earwig, which no one in the movie does except her. It's clearly implied. It's very clearly implied that the second after the movie ends, that plot thread is resolved. And the second after the movie ends, which that means that the second after the movie ends, the most dramatic thing in the movie is supposed to happen. It happens off screen. That annoys me so much. You, you have no idea. Like uh, that's where all all these emotions are. Are you know uh, not just on, like on. her and her uh, and her mom and what she might think or not think about that, but also like her like ex coven slash bandmates. They they were like chasing her down the highway at the start of the movie. They're fucking enemies, you know. I, I, and what do they think about this now? What would happen like right after that? That to me is like. An interesting part of the movie I would really would have liked to see. And the reason I would have liked to see it is because the movie set up that that's something that would, was about to happen. 
I, it just feels... I, it's, it's, I just have it a short dumb. reply. I'll then hand it off after. But I'm thinking, this is basically a found family movie. So I'm thinking that emphasizing too much of the drama on the biological bloodline isn't the good play. You know, I think she being there has a symbolic role, but it isn't really that her finding her real mother would actually change something in her life all that much. Because it shouldn't. Because her family but are the people that, who she that would knows. Be... That would also be a choice one would have to make about the movie that that could be like dramatically presented. Like, like there could be a version of this movie where it is addressed that like she is uninterested in who her original mother is, and uh, and she she's uh, she's her own uh, person. There might be an even more like dramatic version of it where like she just like rejects the the quote unquote cool mom when she comes along and it's like this is my family now. Like you went there for me. That, that that could also be like a version of that. It's just it doesn't do that. It doesn't commit to it. It it doesn't dramatically earn it. It's 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 somewhere in the text or in the subtext. Uh, it's a like adjacent to it, and you can fill in the gaps and find a really interesting version of it. I just wish that you there weren't so get many gaps to fill. I wish the movie had committed to some of it itself. Um, I, I actually kind of disagree now. Nyad, I think you've convinced me. I'm, I'm over to your side. Oh, yeah. Uh, the ending is actually, I, I think it works pretty well. Because um, it, it cleared with me when you said she calls her by her name Earwig. And you're right. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about this like inherited will, this rebellion, this punk rock, fuck you, I'll do it myself attitude. And that's really what um, Earwig's mother wanted to give her more than anything. Because she calls her Earwig. She calls her by the name of the band. Basically an embodiment of her, like, rock lifestyle. The way that she, like, defines herself as this person who will do it herself. We see in the flashback her bandmates are like, you can't go against the coven. And she's like, well, I, I fucking can and I'm going to do it. Uh, and she says in the note to Earwig at the orphanage, um, I'll come back for you when I've taken care of business. So basically, we understand she's uh, she's she's leaving, and assumedly it's you know dangerous perhaps, and she's she's going to take care of business, and then she'll come back uh, to Earwig, uh, like knowing that she's been safe in the orphanage the whole time, uh, because she trusts that Earwig will have, like we said, that inherited punk rock thing, and she has that tape. So maybe playing, you're right, maybe they could have had like a little thing where she was always listening to the tape as a kid, but I think it's important that Ewig was listening to the tape and that inspired her and that gave her that vision because specifically the scene where she first listens to the music is really important and it's literally like, you know, snap zoom into Ewig's face as she hears this uh, like woman uh, just play the guitar and start singing like a fucking god and, and she's just immediately like uh, emboldened by this rock spirit that defines her. So Ewig's mother coming right at the, back at the end is more just like, well, I've resolved that now. I've taken care of business. You know, I lived my life and Ewig is already living her life, not needing her mother to necessarily be there, but like that will uh, across the generations and through the music. It's like really what the movie is, is trying to have. I mean, that, 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 is, that is a good point. Uh, I, I think it's, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a very uh, good and, and charitable way of like looking at, at the ending. Um, can't, don't really have a, a counter argument except that just I didn't find it as, as satisfying in that way. Uh, I think there's also a lot of vagary about like what exactly was the, like the breakup about. Like see, we, we do have this flashback where she says like, you know, I don't want people to tell me what to do, so I'm leaving. And we also have this vague sense of like how serious it is, like a uh, witch coven, like you, you can only replace a witch with another witch. What exactly does it mean? What did it do? What were the consequences? What was the fallout? It's all like, you know, vaguely implied. And uh, I wish there was more clarity about it because uh, because that would give weight to that decision, like and and, and weight to this parallel between. The uh, like uh, the mom and, uh, and and Erica, you know, uh, little little Aya or whatever the uh, earwig or whatever the hell, just because they have the same attitude. But yeah, like, uh, I mean, if we're fan theorizing, I, I my my entire you know made up backstory in my head is that what she betrayed the coven to do was to have earwig, like that's to have interesting a, to have a child against the coven, and the coven says no, you can't. She says, well, I'm gonna fucking do it. 
So like, there's nothing you can do to stop me. And that's why Earwig herself is like, is, is not just, you know, a physical, like, you know, the creation of art and music as your lineage, but like your literal prodigy. Earwig is the band and Earwig is the main character who is her child. Uh, that's, again, you know, just, again that's I wish the game theory. I guess again, we, I wish we can't I wish it was in the text. I wish I watched the movie that that, uh, <laughs> that you that you folks are pitching to me right now, because uh, so, so so many big and little gaps. I, I just think like th- there's there's a really interesting like little little parallel there between the generations where her her mom had this rebelliousness to her. She left the coven, and that like did something that that like uh, messed things up for a lot of people. And like, how does that relate to uh, to to Aya's like little Aya's own like attitude? Uh, is this something she should learn from? Is this some, something she should look up to? It's a theme, but it, it doesn't really does, doesn't really get back. It, it doesn't really resolve. I, I think I am gonna join the squad. I'm very sorry. Um, when you <laughs> but when you make like a movie, especially if it's one hour and twenty two minutes. Uh, I think you have to make some priorities, and I think Platon that um, the I I think what they're trying to say with not showing that more clearly is that it doesn't matter that much. I think the film, whether or not you you can argue that it's successful in this or not, is really trying to amplify or like highlight the the relationship and the between this new family and between the people in this family. And the, there was, there is this plot thread of like her having this background, um, but I don't think it, that is the focus. Uh, I think that they're trying to say that, yes, she did have this past and that, yes, there is this connection, but I think that the connection itself with the music is what's for, important about it and not the background lore about um, the witch's coven or the reason why her mother left uh, or why um, she hasn't returned or this whole backstory. Um, and I think that's just kind of open for interpretation and I think that is fine. I don't uh- think... I, I'd like to respond. To I'd like to respond to that because uh, I, th- I think there's th- there's a contradiction in your argument. There, you're saying, on the one hand, like, hey, this is a like a relatively short movie. They had to make like you know screenwriting economics decisions about what gets in- what there's time for, what gets included, and you're also saying that the whole like backstory of her mom doesn't matter. And like yeah, my because... argument to that would be, then don't include it. But oh, just have on. a movie where she's just an orphan the... and she likes this music. No, no, like, the technicalities that... don't matter. The, like yeah, you don't need to know to about the witch's coven in detail. You don't need to know like if there's a conflict and there's an evil witch that is called something that has sent her into exile. You don't need to know that. You only need to know there is a coven, there's a conflict with hierarchy and she broke out of it. And then you yeah, fill the, the gaps. That is what's the The really thing, the only thing yeah, okay, you have that, to that know really sense, is that the mom was a rebellious person and that she wanted the child to grow up the same way and that in the end she did that and that um you know that that kind of cycle is res- resolved and that this music played its role in kind of reconnecting people and stuff like that uh and i think that thread is kind of why it is in there uh but i don't think these other aspects like the technicalities are that important. I don't think what well, if you would explain the reason why she left the band or why the witches are evil, uh, I don't think it would really strengthen the 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 musical motif in in in, in that strong of a way. So I do kind of understand why they wouldn't go into that. Okay. I- I guess I just think of it as another missed opportunity to like really like d- dig into a, a, a theme to uh, to maybe challenge the main character in some way. But like, yeah, if that's not the intention, then there's no reason for it. I, I, I just thought it was like, it still feels like another gap to me, um, honestly. What I'm wondering, Clayton, is you're often asking for things to be spelled out more clearly, to be put out there. But 
you know, not to put this into too much of a foundational discussion, I'm, I'm just always wondering, does it need to be spelled out? Or can sometimes like images and concepts and characters kind of speak for themselves? For example, if we look at Mandarin and we see he is a troubled artist, he is has deep frustrations in him. Do we need the explicit scene where, you know, we get to where he like opens up and explains and says, yes, uh, the, this, the coven has prohibited us from playing music and I've been ever since struggling as an artist. Like, we're kind of reading a lot into him when we're just judging his few scenes where we like learn of his artistic plight. And I think that's fine. So one thing that I always approach movies like this from, or rather like, let's, let's use it as a, chill, uh, as a movie you watch with your kid. You know, okay, none of us have kids, but like imagine. I'm thinking what I find interesting about children's movies might often be not what is the clear lesson that the movie spelled out that the characters learned, but maybe what kind of conversations can I have with my child about the movie? Hey, what do you think? How would Earwig react when her mom shows up? And then have a conversation from there with your kid. That would be tremendously interesting. And that is, I think, one of the things why I kind of get 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 along well with movies that make me or force me to fill the gaps even. Because I, I really like filling the gaps. I think that is a key concept in literacy to talk to a mu moviegoer about, okay, so we haven't gotten all the on answers, but what did what you experience men mean to you? How do you see this? Like, what do, what do you think happened after? Like, those questions I think are interesting and relevant. And, you know, of course, partially it's due to the unfortunate fact that uh, Diana Wynne-Jones died before finishing this book. But I think it also leaves an interesting opportunity, namely the opportunity to use this openness for something productive. So, like, again, to come back to the question I opened this paragraph with, like, does it need to be spelled out? Uh, no, I think I think you're misconstruing me. I don't want everything to be clearly explained. I just think that there are like th there are like gaps in this movie that aren't like gaps because it's open to interpretation. It's implied with like some like direction choices, character acting choices, like those. That stuff is really good. What, uh, the parts that are missing in this movie, I feel, are like basic stuff to like make character arcs work make like themes come around make like get you know plot threats resolved that are set up early in the movie um and that's like you can absolutely uh, and I, uh, I think uh sif earlier uh said something about like uh, uh, you know all these rules about what a movie's supposed to be that's not what i'm getting at there are like when i say it's like screenwriting rules i mean like some of the basic craft of storytelling and you can absolutely like forego some some you know basic stuff. You can set up something early in the movie that doesn't pay off later, but you have to first of all, you probably shouldn't do that in a like very simple kids movie. You know? Oh, don't underestimate kids. <laughs> no, 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 like you know what I mean. It's it's a it's a children's adventure about this orphan girl, and early in the movie it sets up exactly. She has this really cool mom, and even the kid watching along would be excited for her to find out how badass her mom was. And they don't get that scene. I think I think that's a bit sad. Uh, so like, yeah. First of all, like m maybe like a, a simple kids adventure movie is not the place to like uh, completely like forego like basic screenwriting stuff. And second of all, if you are going to break these like uh, th these guidelines, th it has to be done for like a clear purpose. You have to understand the rules before you start breaking them purposefully. And I don't think this movie does that. So, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like, oh, screenwriting rules. I know it sounds like I'm policing art, but, you know, it's, it's I'm, I, the reason I'm getting to these things is because I'm getting around the, the stuff that I think could make this movie work when it doesn't right now. And if you think the movie works, I'm just, you know, talking nonsense, I, I, I guess. Um, you were asking Yard, like, uh, is it important to fill the gaps? Uh, and, and I respond to that, like, depends on what you're trying to do. And I think this movie is very, like, it's like fundamentally confused about what exactly it's trying to do and the most effective way of doing those things. I think it has some charm. I think it, like, nearly gets there in some way. I can see where it's going, but I don't think it gets there. I mean, I, I can definitely respect your perspective from from this angle I, I can as i conceded basically earlier as well i can imagine many many scenes that i would think would fill the movie with a kind of special resonance that would put it above what it is now 
And I think, you know, that would have been tremendous for me because then it wouldn't have just been a movie I enjoyed tremendously, but would have exceeded way past it, you know, like, but an interesting aspect that I want to like cover, I guess, as my last point to like this big long defense of the movie and maybe my final statement for, for this podcast, because we've been going on for a while, is about children's literature, children's movies and writing for children in general. As part of my thesis on when Marnie was there, I wrote like and researched and wrote like a huge chapter that was basically interested in how does children's literature work? How does children's literature, even in its structure and its form and its content and on average, keep complicated ideas away from children with the idea that they might not get it or might not be capable readers or might not be able to fill the gaps? And I'm just not accusing you of that, but like when you say you'd think like a children's story might not be the place to break with form, I don't I don't necessarily agree. I think children can be viewed as very capable readers. I think children have tremendous ability to fill the gaps or ask questions, you know, talk to their parents uh, about the movie they've just seen. And I think that has a valuable function, one that escapes the text dictating the easy morale for the child to learn, but rather presenting a little bit more of an open-ended thing, something interesting for the children to kind of get familiar with literacy and so on. And I think this is happening here, and I think it happens here because it conforms to the punk spirit of the film. Because Aya is a child who does not accept the simple rules of the adults, so why would the child viewer of this film be expected to accept the simple morals that the adults that made the movie will teach them, you know? There is a bit, a little bit of a free-form rebelliousness, not just in the character of Aya that is supposed to be an inspiration, but also in the sort of structural openness of the film. And I, I think that's a good thing. I like that. Um, I, I think again, it's like what I'm like frustrated about isn't that the fact that this movie like breaks some sc basic screenwriting principles. That's not what what makes me dislike the the movie. It's the other way around. I didn't like the movie. I didn't connect with it. I it felt like it ended so it ended so suddenly. While a lot of the middle portion felt like like kind kind of like boring meandering with like no change in the conflict uh it, it it didn't satisfy me and that's why i'm looking at like screenwriting problems that's why i'm like trying to analyze it i'm trying to pick it apart see like th this has all these like little charming ideas mandrake is great um you know it's like it's got all this potential and it frustrates me that it doesn't get there and i want to know why and that's why i'm pointing out the fact that the prologue, like one of the coolest parts of the entire movie, like the, remember that that little yellow car had like a maw that opened up, like real like real like Ghibli magic stuff, D doesn't come up again. The, the mom doesn't really matter, and like if, if that was the point that we're trying to make, they didn't make it emphatically enough. It, it has to be like passed out in discussion um, in, in this way, and I, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I just. It frustrates me to no end to like to see all these good parts and have them not come together to a whole that like adds up to much. Um, like even if the animation was like as as stellar as m most like uh, Ghibli two D stuff, it, it it would still have that level of frustration uh, for me. And and added to the fact that I, I just feel like it's not pleasant to watch it like aesthetically just just makes it like so much uh, worse of an experience for me and uh yeah i i get like being charitable and all that and, and, and i think uh you lot have made a like real case for like uh, parts of this movie especially the stuff like the mom and the music and you know connecting with an older generation it it, it sort of makes sense um and again, it's in the text. I just, it's just, I wish it earned it better. Um, I, I have here, like in my notes, I have like three different versions of this movie I think would hold, hold together better. Like if you wanted to commit to one of them, like there's obviously the slice of life that we've, we've talked about, you know, just make the movie that the end credits implied, like, ha like short, shorten the, the like bit in the middle where she's, like doing a lot of boring stuff and wants to stop and starts making potions to prank her like adoptive mom. J 
just just shorten that bit and and have have them slowly come around and it, it it's just a nice little slice of life uh and like that that would actually better communicate for for instance that the fact that the original mom didn't matter because like this this like whole everyday like nice vibe over it that would like just make it feel like it doesn't matter instead of this like clear conflict that makes you question whether they know she's the, the, the biological daughter of their old like enemy so that, that that's one way of going about it another way is like um if you want to like commit to like having Bella Yaga be an actual villain, like ha- have her like be much more clearly uh, evil in some way, the, the, having her trapped, have, feeling more perilous, having higher stakes, her trying to get out being like uh, perilous instead of just like the silly, uh, though that that might like get away from some of the like child uh, friendly tones of it. But but it could be interesting. Maybe um, maybe Custard becomes like brave enough to help her get out. Because he he goes there and talks to her through the window, and that's a way to develop the friendship. I don't know, spitballing here. Yeah, we're, we're, all right, we're, we're fully uh, back in this, this script doctoring mode yeah. now. Last one, <laughs> okay, all right. All last right. last one, uh, I, I think would have like uh, fit uh, to, together with the movie as is uh, a lot. It's the um, what you could call the Beauty and the Beast structure, where it's it's about uh, you know this character taken from uh, a place that they're comfortable. Uh, against their will into this place with these like uh, strange and off-putting uh, uh, people, you know? And then over time through like the redemptive power of love or just like childish, you know, glee and chaotic freedom and stuff, you know, she like, you know, th- thaws, like like uh, the, the ice melts away and, and these characters reveal themselves to be like loving beneath the surface. And then, but then you have to like really like give a, stronger character out to, uh, to 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 yaga and the, the mandrake dealing with their issues like maybe maybe Ewig even becomes like a bridge between the like her, her cool mom and them and and, and that becomes like a, a dramatic resolution like near the end of the story where they make amends in some way and that would be very heartwarming wish that was wish that was a movie we wish this movie was a lot of things except the thing uh, it is which is uh, just mediocre in a like way that makes me want to be a script doctor and that mediocrity just hurts a little bit more for me because it's it is a ghibli movie and it knows it's a ghibli movie it it doesn't shy away from that and i think we should be critical of it in that lens and that i think that's the last i have to say about this Uh, also while we're magically wishing for things um i was looking up some of these uh goro introducing the puppets in the studio ghibli like behind the scenes footage they released on youtube kind of wish this movie was all puppets because i love the muppet movies so <laughs> a puppet version of this movie would be amazing Help, we need, stop, we need stop more, motion we need Com- more, commit to more it people need to watch thunderbolt fantasy and understand that anime <laughs> puppets are the way the future is all right um okay I think we've said a lot of things. I want to kind of connect back to the very beginning where we were talking about Goro and how he was freed from the curse of Ghibli by going CG. And as we've discussed, he hasn't really been freed. But I think to tie it all back together, we can, you know, now that we've seen all movies by Goro Miyazaki, we should at least dedicate a little bit to talking about how all of them have daddy issues. (laughs) Like, we have, oh, yeah. we have Earth the which obviously starts with patricide, and we've talked extensively in our Earth Sea cast about how the, you know, shadow of the influence of Hayao Miyazaki is looming over the entire movie. Then we have uh, From Up on Poppy Hill, which is about an entirely complicated, you know, processing of who are my parents, what is my history, where's my father, what is the war, what happened, you know. And now we have this movie, which is about a really rebellious punk kid basically growing up on his own on its own terms on her own terms to make her own thing happen and doesn't that just in a, in a way no matter what you think about the movie doesn't this just beautifully encapsulate what this movie actually is like goro is aya and i think toshio suzuki noticed this as well because he said you know oh goro kun looks a bit like aya <laughs> goro didn't like this uh, so the stories go that he was compared like this but for us as viewers of the Ghibli canon, 
and this being the last Ghibli movie to date that is out. Um, this really, I guess, puts a good capstone on Goro Miyazaki thus far, that this movie is him really rebelliously breaking out from all the limitations of the Ghibli style and doing a weird, his own thing, alongside a story that features these themes exactly, kind of. Yeah, like, honestly, good for him. Like, if, if this is what it took to, like, get at something original and, like, who who knows, maybe with, like, some uh, some more experience with the technology, maybe with like uh, you know uh, some uh, like a, a stronger script sometime in the future. Like maybe he ha- he has like a something good in him that uh, that really like uh, makes use of like CGI in a way we don't see uh, Japanese animation do that much. I, I think that could be interesting. This this might be a um, a stepping stone towards something better. Uh, and, and, and like that that's that's the most like hopeful uh take i would have about th- this movie um or the the unfortunate thing about like that little anecdote of like suzuki comparing uh, goro to uh, to aya is um just watching this movie aya is like just 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 a little shit so i think <laughs> that might have been an insult i love her so much though i fucking love her she's great yeah, she is great. Like, I really f- appreciate how she breaks from the uh, the typically assumed Ghibli girl. She's she's like a demanding brat that wants to get her own way. Yeah, so it, it does match with the feelings, you know, punk rock nature, wanting to be a, a new direction for the studio, for Goro. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe he couldn't escape it, unfortunately, but it's about trying, you know. That's what the movie also teaches us. You could uh, even if you're up against the fucking demon guy. And a witch, you still gotta just try everything you can. Can I yeah. also want to add to that because, like, you know, we're saying like we're, we keep saying about Goro Miyazaki, and I really feel for him because you know, and I think this movie also kind of exemplifies in my head that greatness is overrated. I think, like, not everyone can be uh, can be Hayao Miyazaki. The chance that the child of Hayao Miyazaki would be as talented, as insane, and as like basically the same as Hayao Miyazaki is unimaginably small, um, and that is fine. Like I don't think we have to expect greatness from Goro. I don't think we have to expect some insane, high-minded, um, Mononoke-esque, Mononoke Hime-esque film from him. I think it is fine and good to make these kinds of movies that go on TV, that entertain kids, that have some cool lesson for them to learn, that have some wins with some kind of adventure. Uh, there are thousands of directors that toil away every day to make these sorts of things. Um, and that is absolutely fine. Um, I think that that is cool and that they deserve to be paid well and that they deserve to be uh, regarded with some kind of level of respect. Um, I don't think everyone has to be great, and I think we should keep that in mind for for Goro. I think that is very uh, that is very important uh, important principle to me, and and that's not really directed for anyone here in the cast who I think is making that kind of assertion, but also just to keep in mind generally that. Just because you're the son of someone who is very critically well received, you're not required to be a great director, be go into the history. It is completely fine to be a to not be great. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. I'm just I'm just gonna say yeah. that. Yeah. Everyone everyone can't be a Sofia Coppola or a Brandon Cronenberg. It doesn't always work out that well. <laughs> Uh, also, I just realized, did, did we say this or am I blanking? Like, the movie is about a really cool, like, rock star who's, like, gives her kid the will to be a, a cool punk rock rock star uh, themselves. And it's like, what was Miyazaki if not a guy who was, like, in the animation system in Toei and was like, man, fuck this. I don't like any of the way this is. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to, like, go against the trend. I'm going to be my own person. I'm only ever going to make the movies I want to make. Maybe Goro isn't as good as his dad, but like he's certainly taken that lesson of anything else. 
I guess, I guess, I guess like who's the, who's the witch's coven in this situation? Toy. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, the, yes. The, the witch's coven is Toy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they they they're after him, and that that that's why uh, Goro uh, grew up with a, a kind of absent father figure. Uh, glad we got that sorted out. Um, no, but I think to to what you're saying, Sif, I I I agree. I um I think there's there's like two ways about that. On on the one hand, like the the pressure that Goro must be under, and the, the like um like i i do not envy the guy i absolutely do not and it, it's it's kind of like s- sad that he he's been like um put in this position where like he he has like in my opinion like one decently good movie under his belt and two like uh at the at the like bottom of the barrel of the ghibli canon um but i th- i think uh you know s- similar how to us like um like, uh, like sim- similar to how like we shouldn't let our fondness for a, like a director blind us to their flaws. I think we shouldn't let our sympathies like uh, like j- just cover for the fact that like at the end of all this, at the at the end of like yes, he's allowed to not be great. However, a lot of people who are not great don't get to like make movies with like one of the most prestigious animation studios in the world. And like this, this, this guy did. And I, I, I don't think it came out well. And I think, I think that's, I think that's sad. And I think it's fair to be critical of it. Um, Fucking nepotism. Like, yeah. He's, 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 not, he's not like Goro Miyazaki is, isn't a like a cute little, a cute little boy who needs protection. He's a, like, he's a big, named director who like made a, a bad movie again in my opinion and i think uh, i think that's important as well uh oh yeah one last thought if, if we're wrapping everything up yeah we didn't talk about the dub it's honestly one of the worst ghibli dubs pretty pretty lame mostly americans trying to do very bad english accents uh Ewig sounds like she's australian but uh absolute perfect genius casting uh richard e grant as mandrake is unbelievable. Uh, he should have his own show. Uh, Mandrake's best boy. Love him to death. Yeah, uh, be- best part of the movie, easily. Yeah. Beautiful. So, as we're now coming to a conclusion, I want to pick up on one thing that was said to transition us into announcing what is happening to the Nausicaa's next. And we didn't really explicitly agree amongst each other, but we've been discussing many options, and I think this is the best choice to go forward from here. Um, we were talking about how Toei is the evil witch's covenant, and how about we watch a movie that is exactly that, as a plot, where Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki, together as leaders of the animators' union at Toei, try to prove the evil witch's covenant of Toei, the corporate overlord, that they could make a movie called The Great Adventure of Horus, Prince of the Sun. Perfect, it all comes around. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, it's all coming together. So to make it really clear what the announcement is, uh, as we have now covered all of the actual Studio Ghibli movies, uh, until How Do You Live comes out, uh, at which point we will return to the familiar old Nausicaa style, we will of course be covering more movies. This podcast is not over. Everyone who stuck it up with us this long, uh, we will continue. And what this movie uh, that I just announced is the first feature film directed by Isao Takahata, so we are using it as a jumping off point, probably into just following through with the earlier career of Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki before Studio Ghibli was a thing, and with a couple of movies leading up to it. I think it's four or five movies in total, a couple of shorts, a TV series as well. We don't know how we feel about TV series. We haven't covered a TV series before. We don't know if we are really into that. I think we will talk about that, but I think Horos Prince of the Sun as Isao Takahata's first movie is the obvious choice for us to go to next month. All right. Uh, so, uh, a- anyone got a keyboard to uh, to you know rock us out you know, with a solo? Uh, just you know my uh, mechanical keyboard on my desk, and that's not really a good sound. You know, nobody wants mm. to hear that. Uh, but let's just say, uh, please support us on our Patreon, join our Discord server, listen to this podcast wherever you can find it, recommend it to a friend, tell everyone the Nausicaa's has been freed of the curse of Ghibli and is now going to uh, still continue talking about the movies by Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki. And uh, see you all next time when we will be tracing this career from the start. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.